a House committee today focused on the role and responsibilities of the National Guard. This hearing examined proposed federal reforms, as well as increasing requirements by states on the National Guard and Homeland Security plans. This is just over three and a half hours. Good morning. The quorum being present, the Committee on Government Reform hearing entitled Transforming the National Guard, Resourcing for Readiness will come to order. Chairman Davis will be arriving shortly, but he asked me to open the hearing so we can get all the testimony in the record. Governor Pataki, we understand you have a tight schedule and we appreciate you being here. Uh, I ask unanimous consent to uh, allow the governor to testify and answer questions after Mr. Waxman and I have made opening statements, but before other members do so. But if it's just Mr. Lantos and my colleague from Virginia, we probably could have all four of us do it. Uh, without objection, so ordered. The committee convenes today to discuss important issues raised by plans to transform and modernize the National Guard to meet the demands of a growing set of domestic and global missions. We captioned the hearing resourcing for readiness because members need to know Guard units will be equipped and trained to perform both the homeland security and global defense tasks assigned them. In the past, the total force the operational union of active duty and reserve component units didn't always add up. National Guard units too often languished at the end of the supply chain with limited training on hand-me-down equipment. At the national level, significant strides have been made reshaping military capabilities to meet an uncertain world of lethal threats at home and asymmetrical warfare overseas. But much more needs to be done to clarify the operational and physical implications of new military missions within the sovereign borders of the states, where National Guard members can be called to duty by both the governor and the president. Federal mobilization of National Guard units can draw heavily from local first responder ranks, degrading domestic readiness. So the shape, size, and mission of the National Guard of the future will have significant intergovernmental implications. Governors, county executives, mayors, and hospital administrators are trying to build response capabilities and enhance preparedness without knowing who the federal government might bring or take away when disaster strikes. To train as they fight, guard units have to take part in local and regional exercises. Equipment, inoperability standards, and communication channels have to be established before the next attack is upon us. But National Guard civil support capabilities are not yet well integrated into state and local response plans. When the battle lines stretch from Baghdad to Bridgeport, from Kandahar to Kinderhook, new approaches are needed to be sure the National Guard is ready to confront the threat at home and abroad. Building on rich traditions that predate our Constitution, the citizens' militias that are the National Guard today bring awe-inspiring patriotism and skill to their work in our common defense. They deserve to know they will have the equipment and training they need to succeed in their 21st century missions. Uh, at this time, the uh, chair uh, recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Waxman, for his opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for holding this hearing. I'm pleased that the committee has been focusing attention on the increasing demands facing our National Guard members. We must do everything we can to ensure that the National Guard can meet its myriad responsibilities without overburdening the dedicated and brave Guard members who risk their lives to serve. For over 350 years, the country has looked to the National Guard to provide security within our borders and assist in local disaster relief. But in the past few years, Guard members have been activated for federal duties with increasing frequency, and the Guard's responsibilities have been growing exponentially. The shift from an essentially reserve role to active participation in the nation's security forces has placed tremendous strains on the National Guard system. We in Congress have heard countless stories about problems Guard soldiers have experienced from poor training to inferior equipment and health care to delays in pay to the negative effects 
of long de deployments. We can't keep expecting these men and women to be everywhere and to serve indefinitely. We need direction and forethought from our military and state leaders and a clear plan that considers the increasing burdens facing the National Guard. To this end, I support the efforts of General Blum and his counterparts at the Department of Defense and Department of Homeland Security to formulate a plan for restructuring the National Guard. I look forward to hearing more from today's witnesses about this plan and any other steps necessary to ensure that the National Guard is best equipped to fulfill its important duties within and outside our nation's borders. Thank you. We have a UC that says we go right to the witness, but I know that we have a senior member, Mr. Lantos, and we have Mr. McHugh, who's from New York. And I guess what I would do is just say that the governor has to leave by 11, so it would make sense to go to his testimony. But is there anyone who would just like to make a short comment? Mr. Uh, Mr. McHugh, would you I, like I, to I, just? I will be very brief. I certainly want to add my words of welcome and to note to my fellow committee members, as I suspect they fully understand, and the reason the governor is here, this governor uh, is a lot of very great things, uh, known to New Yorkers and known uh, particularly after September 11th to every American. Uh, but one of the things he is most of all is, a, is an amazing leader of the uh, New York National Guard. Through his initiatives and his programs, New York State National Guard receives support and benefits that uh, are really second to none in this nation. And we have before us a gentleman who can help us understand a great deal about uh, the demands on the Guard here in the new realities of the 21st century, but also can teach us a great deal about uh, what other states might do to have as effective an organization. So, Governor, welcome. It's good to see you again. Thank you, uh, Jeff. The Chair would recognize Mr. Lantos and then hope that we could go to Mr. Pataki, if it's okay. Mr. Lantos, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm particularly delighted to welcome my good friend, Governor, Potoki, which is the proper pronunciation of his name. Um, for all of my colleagues, every single Hungarian word is accented on the first syllable, and it's Potoki. Um, and I, I am particularly pleased that he is testifying today because his state is a perfect illustration of the wisdom of the legislation I introduced namely preventing National Guardsmen and Guardswomen from incurring severe financial losses and their families incurring severe financial hardships as they are activated. The state of New York provides the differential between the military pay and the former civilian pay. And I want to commend the governor for his state's action along these lines. And when it comes, comes time to question him, I will ask him what the cost of this has been for the state of New York, whether it has entailed additional appropriations, and what in his judgment has been the impact on morale New York State is leading by giving us an example of how to handle this problem. And it's long overdue that the administration drops its, drop its opposition to what is a common sense, singularly nonpartisan approach to a severe issue of recruitment and retention. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Mr. Pata uh, Mr. Pataki. 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 <laughs> Pataki? Yeah. Governor, uh, as you may know, it is our practice to swear in all our witnesses, being that this is an investigative committee, and mm -hmm. we'd ask you to stand and raise your right hand, yes. please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give uh, to this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you so much, Governor. Uh, you have the floor, um, and we welcome you, and we know you have a very busy schedule. Thank you for honoring us. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman, and to Congressman Lantos and to Congressman McHugh and the other members. Thank you all for uh, having me before you this morning and for the opportunity to speak on this important subject. At no time in America's history has the National Guard played so critical a role in both the security of our homeland 
and in our nation's military objectives overseas. In today's world, the notion of the traditional citizen soldier training one weekend a month and two weeks a year for a war that might never occur is a thing of the past. Our troops are actively engaged on the front lines, supporting both our state's efforts to keep New York safe at home and our nation's efforts to combat terror abroad. In February, I had the great privilege of joining five other governors from across the nation on an historic bipartisan mission to visit our troops in Iraq. I was inspired by the tremendous spirit, professionalism, and resolve of each and every one of the soldiers I met. They understand the mission before them and why we must seize the opportunity to break the back of terror so that our children and their children can live in freedom. The trip also reinforced just how involved and essential the role of our National Guard troops is to our nation's mission. Each day, we flew in and out of Iraq from Amman, Jordan, and it was National Guard soldiers who piloted us each way. And everywhere I went, I met with National Guard soldiers from New York and from the other states. As I speak this morning, more than 3,700 of the New York National Guard members are currently on active duty, supporting state security missions at home, federal security missions under Operation Noble Eagle, and overseas military operations as part of Operation Enduring Freedom and in Ra in Iraqi Freedom. Thousands more are engaged in regularly scheduled training and operational requirements around the state, the nation, and the world. From riflemen to fighter pilots, in the turrets of Humvees and in the huge bellies of C-5 galaxies, New York National Guard soldiers and airmen are providing a historic level of support to the coalition forces in Iraq and Afghanistan. From a total force perspective, the Guard has never played a more vital role in major combat operations. What truly sets the Guard apart, however, is its dual role. Our Guardsmen and women are not just part-time members of our nation's military forces. They are our state's primary emergency response force, providing support to their communities and to civil authorities and first responders throughout the state. At no time in New York's history was this aspect of the National Guard's role more evident than on September 11th of 2001. Within hours of the attacks on the World Trade Center, 1,500 New York National Guard troops from units within New York City had reported to duty. Another 1,500 units from upstate New York were en route. In less than 24 hours after the attacks, over 8,000 New York National Guard soldiers and airmen were on active duty supporting New York State's security needs. These troops provided not just a calming presence on the streets of New York during very unsettling times, they provided New York's first responders with critical perimeter security support, refueling for civil emergency vehicles, emergency lighting, power generation, communications, emergency transportation, engineering assets, and other logistical support. In the days, weeks, and months that followed, our National Guard force would assume missions and responsibilities within New York State that never could have been imagined by previous generations of National Guard soldiers. Today, hundreds of New York Army National Guard soldiers are serving on state active duty as part of Task Force Empire Shield. These soldiers support security operations at New York's major rail stations and at nuclear power facilities, missions that have been ongoing every day since September 11th. During times that warrant an even higher elevation of the threat level, the National Guard's Task Force Empire Shield is integrated into NYSHIELD, the state's multi-agency joint security task force headed by the New York State Office of Public Security. In addition, our civil support team for weapons of mass destruction is on call 24 hours a day to respond to incidents known or suspected to involve nuclear, biological, or chemical weapons. We continue to deploy our CST to provide proactive precautionary monitoring at major public events and strategic locations throughout the city and state of New York. 
Soon our CST will play an instrumental role in the stand-up of a new type of National Guard capability, a chemical, biological, radioactive, nuclear, and explosive, or seaburn enhanced response force. This Joint National Guard Task Force will integrate CST with an enhanced medical company possessing robust decamination and treatment capabilities, engineering assets specializing in research and rescue, in search and rescue, and specially trained combat units capable of supporting civilian law enforcement. Even with all of these added responsibilities and missions, the New York National Guard remains our state's primary emergency response force. As New York's governor, I've called upon New York's Guard more than any other governor in our state's history. Each time they've responded heroically and met every mission asked of them, particularly in times of crisis. The attack on the World Trade Center, eight natural disasters, four plane crashes, 11 crippling blizzards, two major wildfires, a statewide blackout, and now, of course, the threat of global terror. National Guard Bureau Chief uh, Lieutenant General Blum is working in Washington to transform the Guard into a modern, highly relevant, and appropriately structured force capable of combating the asymmetrical threat of terror at home and terror threat abroad. I salute General Blum's efforts to enhance and modernize the Guard's mission while preserving both its relevancy to the Department of Defense and the capabilities it provides to the governors. As State Commander-in-Chief of one of the largest Guard forces in the nation, I'm encouraged by General Blum's vision and his appreciation of the Guard's dual role and the necessity of preserving that role. General Blum is committed to enhancing the National Guard's role as an active participant in the nation's military force, and he aims to preserve and enhance the National Guard's state role simultaneously. As we work to transform the United States military, and specifically the National Guard, it's critical to ensure that the governors who are most intimately familiar with and better understand their unique needs retain the ability and authority to deploy their National Guard troops to best meet those needs. General Blum's transformation plan would allow for a generous National Guard contribution to federal missions at, at home and abroad and ensure that at least 50 to 75 percent of a state's National Guard troops remain available for state active duty. His model shows real commitment to the traditional dual role of the National Guard, and it is one I strongly support. When President Bush gave authorization to deploy troops to airports across the nation after the September 11th attacks, New York was, of course, among the first to respond. Because this mission was in Title 30, 32 status, where troops are paid federally but remained under their state's command and control, rather than in Title 10 status, where they would have served under the active duty Army, we were able to meet this requirement quickly, smoothly, and with the troops best suited for the tasking. From an operational standpoint, this approach makes the most sense and is consistent with General Blum's innovative thinking on this matter. We need to ensure that troops activated under th Title 32 status remain under the authority and control of the state's governor to ensure maximum flexibility and effective deployment. General Blum's plan promises to bring predictability and regularity to federal deployment of National Guard units. His full spectrum availability model would call for one federal Title 10 Army Guard deployment every six years and one Air Guard rotation every 15 months. This would distribute the burden equally among states and units and provide predictability and ample planning time for both unit commanders, their individual troops, and their families. Having spoken directly with families of deployed troops across New York and having talked with troops on the ground during my trip to Iraq in February, I can tell you that General Blum's plan is not only welcome, but it is urgently necessary. In today's, in today's post-September 11th climate, we are asking more from our National Guard troops than ever before. In New York, we strongly believe it is incumbent upon our government to do more for our troops than ever before. No state in the nation is doing more than New York to support our troops and their families. 
Last year, I was proud to propose and sign an historic measure called the Patriot Plan into law. The Patriot Plan, without question, provides the most comprehensive package of protections and benefits in the nation to assist New York's military personnel and their families. This historic package of benefits and protections for deployed New York National Guard and Reserve troops was a recognition that the National Guard, like the rest of the U.S. military, cannot hope to continue its mission without these brave men and women who join its ranks. The Patriot Plan has 28 different benefit packages for our guardsmen, including, and I will just briefly summarize because I know it's a long hearing, including providing the difference between a state employee's pay and their active duty compensation, providing free tuition for the children and families of National Guard members who are killed or seriously injured in defending our freedom, and a number of other benefits as well. Quite simply, we have, to, we have two basic roles here. One is to understand the importance of the state mission that the Guard plays as we call upon it for enhanced federal activity, and second, the sacrifice that the families have to make while their loved ones are away. And to the extent that we can provide additional benefits, that's what we need to make sure the Guard remains strong and effective. Thank you. Thank you for a very helpful statement, Governor. Um, we have a number of people going to do the five-minute rule. We're going to go with Mr. Schrock, uh, then Mr. Waxman if he returns, uh, then Mr. McHugh, and then Mr. Lantos. I'd love it if other members will be able to, if you're able to stay beyond 11, it would be great. But let's give it a shot. Mr. Schrock. Thank you, Governor. Thank you for being here. Thank you uh, for your testimony. Thank you for going to Iraq. I've been to Iraq and uh, Afghanistan a few times, and whether they're guard, whether they're reserves or active duty forces, they all work together as one cohesive use, unit, and that's a wonderful thing, frankly. Um, you talked about the dual role, and I'm, I just have one question I'm going to ask. Is there a benefit, to, in your opinion, to re redefining the role of the National Guard uh, in responding to homeland security concerns? And looking back at the last two and a half years, uh, what have you found are the major stumbling blocks to helping the Guard uh, respond to their homeland security challenges in your state, and do you do we need to redefine the authorities of the state governors and the adjutant generals? Uh, we we have uh, within our state we have had I hate to use the word, but virtually seamless efforts to uh, respond to any homeland security uh, problems within New York State. We have a well thought out plan. We're able to implement that plan. And the fact that the adjutant general, uh, the local commanders, can determine what force to use for a particular mission has been enormously helpful. I'll just give you one example. When we call on National Guard troops to perform a particular mission that doesn't require a skill set, we ask for volunteers so that we minimize the disruption in these citizen soldiers' lives. You couldn't do that if there were federal controls. So we're very pleased with the response of the Guard and the ability to command and control the Guard within the state. You think it works fine then? I think within our state it works very well. I, uh, the, the area of concern that we all have, I think, is to make sure that the, the homeland security role within the states under the command and control of the governors is understood as a critical mission of the Guard as they assume a more important federal role and that the sacrifice that the families make is understood and we do what we can to, over, to help them uh, in ev on every different front. Great. Thank you. Uh, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Landers, you can now question Mr. Pataki. <laughs> thank, you thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Governor, I again want to commend you for your leadership on this whole complex issue. But I'd like to zero in on a legislation I introduced almost mm -hmm. a year ago. And I must admit that I find it very disturbing when I don't understand the source of the opposition or the logic behind the opposition, I know you will be able to help me. In New York State, you recognize the obvious that at a time of war, we must have, if not equality of sacrifice, because we cannot attain that, but we must have an attempt at sharing sacrifice and to place on the families of activated National Guards people horrendous financial burdens, financial strains of major proportions, 
people losing their homes because they cannot pay their mortgage, children discontinuing their college education because the parents can't pay tuition. It makes eminently good sense not to impose on an activated National Guardsman or woman an additional financial burden. Now, in New York, you're doing this, and I want to congratulate you. May I ask your general judgment about the philosophy behind my legislation, namely preventing financial losses for people who are already called upon to make a major personal sacrifice. Uh, well, Congressman, I, 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 of course I agree with the, the need that we have, not just at the state level, but at the federal level, to understand the economic impact this has on a citizen soldier who has been activated. Uh, it's very different from a career professional military person who uh, understands the pay scale and accepts that pay scale as part of their career determination. A citizen soldier too often will see their, uh, their income dramatically reduced. Now, how you deal with that, I think you can do it on many different fronts. And in fact, uh, Congress first began to respond to that concern with the Soldiers and Sailors Relief Act that was passed back during World War II. But obviously, circumstances have changed dramatically since World War II. So I think there are a number of different approaches. One is to provide additional benefit when, in the form of salary enhancement or making up the gap when someone suffers a significant diminution of, of earnings. Another is to make sure that uh, we do cap interest rates. And I know the Soldiers and Sailors Relief Act does that at 6%. Given the historically low interest rates now, perhaps they could be lowered even more. Uh, our plan not only provides to make up that salary differential, but as an example, if a young man or young woman goes out and leases an SUV uh, that they use and then they get called to active duty, we allow them to cancel that lease uh, so that they don't uh, have any penalty at all. If they're enrolled in school, and they're activated. We require that school to give them tuition back and their fees back for the portion of the semester they were there and keep, the balance, keep that slot open so when they come back they know it exists. So, so there are a whole gamut of benefits, uh, including salary enhancement that, that we are looking to do at the state level and I think it is appropriate to do at the federal level as well. Congressman, just one point though, and this is something where I'm commenting from afar because I'm not a part of the federal military or chain of command, but one of the important things we cannot do is have a differential among those in the guard so that people are reluctant to call up a particular unit because of the additional cost factor if that skill set is needed. So I don't know if that is in fact a relevant uh, uh, consideration as your legislation and others is considered, but it's just something that we have to be able to call upon the people we need with the skills they need without concern to the economic cost to the country. We have to be concerned about the economic impact on, on those soldiers and sailors uh, and their families. Governor, if I may uh, pursue this for one more moment. Obviously, we all know that we face serious problems of re-enlistment, retention, enlistment, given the new nature of the global struggle we are engaged in. In view of that fact, do you view the New York program as a success? Uh, the New York program is a success. As I, as I indicated earlier, one of the first things we did well before September 11th is we uh, created a program where if you enlist in the National Guard, you get free tuition at our state or city universities or an equivalent in a private or parochial. And that had a very dramatic impact on, on and, uh, recruitment. Uh, now we have seen since September 11th and since the operations overseas, recruitment holding steady and in fact a little bit increase over the last couple of months. We are concerned about retention as thousands of our National Guard troops come back. Uh, it's too soon to tell, but one significant enhancement of the benefit package for our National Guard troops that we believe would help with both recruitment and retention would be to provide health benefits uh, to those who enlist in the National Guard. It's something that they would be uh, able to access under the federal program uh, and it would have an enormous help to both encourage 
the enlistment in the first place and the retention of those who are coming back. I want to thank you, Governor. I want to commend you for your achievement. Thank you very much, Congressman. Thank you, uh, Mr. McHugh. Thank you very much. Uh, again, Governor, welcome. Always good to see you. By the way, I was thank just you. talking to uh, Senator Cool, and he sends his best. Uh, don't know which way his train's headed today, but uh, that's <laughs> another issue. Um, my friend from California brings up a serious consideration, and uh, from my other perspective as the chairman of the Personnel Subcommittee on Armed Services, I, I commend him for his concern and for his leadership on it. Uh, I, I was pleased to hear your response, Governor, and uh, it's a program you've initiated that I tried to uh, acknowledge and praise in my opening comments, uh, but obviously I'm very familiar with. And again, God bless you for that insight and, and that leadership. Uh, but as I think your response indicated, there's, there's a whole range of things that can and probably should be done in terms of benefit packages for the Guard, for the Reserve component in general that uh, can show both our appreciation and also our concern about retention and recruitment. And you have, as my friend from California suggested, been a, a national leader on that. Um, uh, by Mr. Lantos mentioned the administration's opposition, and I think technically that's true, but I think it's important just to note for the record that the, uh, the military services oppose that initiative as well because of their concern about the morale impact uh, of placing two service members in this new era, one active, the other guard or reserve, where they're doing the same job and taking the same bullets and in the same foxhole and being paid different, different levels. Will my friend yield for a second? I'll, I'll yield in just a moment. I'll give you a second. Uh, I'm not sure that concern is justified. There have been attempts in the past to try to provide pay differentials that have failed an insurance policy that was run um, through Gulf War I. Uh, we are aggressively searching for a way in which we can help that one-third, in fact, about one-third of the Guard and Reserve that are deployed actually lose money, about a third stay the same, and about the other third actually makes money uh, because it is a legitimate point. But it, it, it has proven to be far more complex here at the congressional level and at the Washington level than, than just passing a bill to mandate it. And uh, we are trying to work through that. And with that, I'd be happy to yield to my friend from California. I will just make one quick point and, and thank my good friend for, for yielding. I find a profound inconsistency in the administration's opposition, while at the same time, the administration is praising private employers for maintaining salary levels of activated people. Well, you can't, they can't have it both ways. They can't praise a company for doing exactly what my legislation is calling for while opposing the legislation. Well, this I, is it, profoundly inconsistent. Reclaiming my time, and I, I understand the gentleman's, I understand the gentleman's point, but as I, know, I tried to note, maybe I wasn't clear enough, there, there is a distinction between the administration's concerns about the gentleman's proposal, and and they're praising private employers and the military's opposition. I was referring to the military's concern, and I'm not delegitimatizing the, the gentleman's point. I just wanted to let him know that we're we're trying to work through that. That having been said, Governor, <laughs> I actually want to ask you about recruiting. Yeah, it's very pleasant to let the two of you debate. Uh, I'm used to being in the middle of it in uh, in Albany. Well, well. Uh, we, we appreciate, and if you, if you weren't so down and foresighted on this, it wouldn't have been a problem, but your great job uh, raised a very important point, and, and we need to deal with it, and we thank you for drawing our attention to it. Um, I was gonna ask you about, about recruitment and retention because that does become important uh, in the reserve components, and General Blum was kind enough to drop by my office uh, not so very long ago and talk about the discussions he had with you and some of the other governors with respect to that need to retain both the control uh, of those forces uh, through the Title 32 provisions, but also the need to ensure you have sufficient manpower, person power, I guess, in this day and age, uh, to meet those uh, 
those kinds of emergencies and demands back home. And as someone who's got a few nuclear power plants in his district and has mm -hmm. had all of those snowstorms you spoke about and the ice storm and others where the National Guard that you deployed uh, and activated uh, came and helped, uh, that's something we want to see happen. So you are, as I understand your comments, uh, at least for the moment encouraged, if not optimistic, that General Blum is in the right direction and that'll be helpful in ensuring that you have as a governor what you need. Yes, I think General Blum has outlined a very sound strategy that uh, not only works from a federal uh, force perspective, but works from the standpoint of the governors, their guard, and the guards' families. Uh, one of the important elements is to have some predictability and some uh, warning as to when you're going to be uh, called for federal duty. Uh, after September 11th, obviously, we were all starting uh, in an era that we had not anticipated and, uh, and could not, if we had tried, prepared for. It was just very different to see this type of attack upon our soil against civilians. So uh, uh, when our, uh, some of our guard components were, were activated for federal duty, uh, they hadn't been prepared, either uh, as a family or, or militarily, to, to respond, and it took some time. But that is a thing of the past. I honestly believe that. Right now, uh, we are seeing some, we get the advance notice. The units are, are uh, on a list, and uh, they do have the training, the preparation. And when they're called to duty, uh, they are called for a mission as opposed to being called and then en ending up waiting, which happened uh, uh, shortly after September 11th quite a bit. So I'm very pleased with how the federal action in dealing with, to the extent they can, uh, predictability, notification, training, and equipment is, is uh, prevailing. And Congressman, let me just uh, thank me you for a moment, because you and I have been to Fort Drum together a number of times, and the 10th Mountain Division, of course, is, uh, is headquartered there, and they've played a critical role in, in Afghanistan and uh, in the entire war against terror. And you've done a tremendous job in making sure that that facility and that great unit uh, is one of the finest, if not the finest, in the world. I think well, we need to move on Thank you very here. much, Mr. I thank the I gentleman. yield back. Thank we're you, gonna, Governor. And we're going to go to Mr. Ruppersberger, then Ms. Miller, and then Mr. Tierney, and then Ms. Blackburn. Mr. Ruppersberger. Okay, Governor, thank you. First, thank having you. A, a job like yours and managing a lot of issues you have to deal with, uh, you do a, a great job. Um, thank you. We, when, uh, when I was in Iraq, as you were, you talked with the troops, and I think the, one of the biggest issues with the National Guard and the Reserves, too, were, were what was happening when they got back to their home life and with their families and their jobs and issues like that. And I think really the, you call it the Patriot Plan is, is an admirable plan and, and uh, I think probably has given a lot of comfort to those individuals. But, but we still have a long way to go. And yes. there, are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of problems when, when our, our men and women come back and we're gonna have to face that down the road. Uh, to begin with, the issue of recruitment because we, we do have a dual role, and that dual role, I'm sure, will continue on for many years to come based on what's happening in the world today. Where, where does New York stand as far as the recruitment of your National Guard, and what is your plan to, to continue on to make sure we have uh, we, we have, uh, as, I, as I indicated, we have had recruitment levels uh, not just remain the same so that we can maintain our current force level. Uh, it has actually uh, gone up uh, a little bit over the course of the past few months. Uh, we had a, a terrible record in the early and mid, early mid 90s uh, in recruitment. Uh, but one of the program we began a number of things. One was the free tuition program, and that had an enormous impact on young people to understand uh, that by serving their state and their country, they could at the same time get education without any any charge, and it dramatically improved recruitment. Um, we also began to use them more so that they had constructive missions, uh, not just uh, in response to emergencies, whether it was TWA 800 or the ice storm in Congressman McHugh's district or some of the other disasters, but we created something called Guard Help where they would proactively work with communities. And uh, just one example in the South Bronx, the Bronx River was this polluted uh, uh, entity. It's a wonderful uh, water body where you had truck bodies and debris blocking the stream. And we brought in a guard engineering crew uh, to work with the community and clean it out. So they, they had a mission. 
uh, where they were helping their communities. They had a sense of purpose as well as uh, that enhanced benefit. So it worked extremely well. We're pleased with the recruitment level that continues now. Uh, our concern, as I indicated, is with the troops coming back, uh, what the retention rate will be, and we just don't know because it's too soon. How about the issue of retention? Uh, we don't know. Uh, I think one, we're not sure. We're, we're hopeful because from uh, the, uh, most of our National Guard troops in Iraq have gotten back within the last weeks. Uh, and I believe there's a 90-day period when they come back where they make the determination. So we haven't seen people saying yes or no yet. Anecdotally, uh, we're hopeful, but it's too soon to really say. But having said that, uh, it's always better to retain more. And, and if we could enhance National Guard, the National Guard, uh, by providing health care benefits, the military federal health care benefits for someone who enrolls in the National Guard, it would help on both levels. It would help with recruitment because it would be another benefit and reason for someone to choose to serve. Uh, uh, and I when agree. the soldiers came back, it would help with retention because they would have a significant benefit they might not have in civilian life. That would be excellent. You know, it's amazing the, the uh, patriotism that, that the, both the National Guard and Reserve and, and career in the United States and abroad in Iraq uh, have at this point. Uh, get to another issue as far as local government is concerned. You have a lot of your first responders, especially in your volunteer fire and paramedics, uh, that have been called to service. And it's causing a problem uh, with some of the, the stations that have to deal, at least in my state, state of Maryland. Um, what, uh, what impact is the that having with well, it, it has had an impact a, a significant percentage of our National Guard are first responders and a lot of them are our police officers and correction officers and uh, before we passed the Patriot plan we listened to the local governments and they said well we're losing three of our police officers a small town up in upstate New York so what and we don't want to hire new ones uh, because they'll be coming back so what we did as part of our plan is in that law now uh, local governments can bring back retirees to fill a position of someone who has been activated to National Guard duty, and it's a very intelligent program. Okay. A retired firefighter, a retired police officer, uh, someone from that community gets activated. The, the local government doesn't want to train somebody else knowing that this person will be returning in a year, so they can bring back someone. So, right. so we have had the problem. This is one of the ways we've looked to deal with it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The chair would recognize Ms. Miller. Mrs. Miller, excuse me. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Governor, thank you so much for uh, being here today. I must say that um, uh, watching you after the absolutely horrific attacks on our nation of 9-11, we all look to you as a nation's governor, quite frankly, and your leadership that you demonstrated at that time has, uh, has really been a very significant thing, so we certainly appreciate uh, you being here today and your comments. I share your concern about retention with the National Guard. Uh, I actually have a, a National Guard base in my district uh, in Michigan, which has been sort of the staging area for our, uh, almost the Midwest, quite frankly, for many of the Guard and Reserve components as they've uh, deployed to Afghanistan, Iraq, Uzbekistan, what have you. Uh, it's interesting, um, uh, actually over 30 percent now uh, of all of our troops uh, in theater are uh, National Guard or Reserve. So they really, as you mentioned in the total force concept, are such a critical component of all of that. I would just make one comment as well as we talk about retention that though one of our guard units, the uh, Michigan Red Devils uh, who fly F-16s, uh, the 107th is over in uh, Iraq right now and when they deployed they had more volunteers than they actually could accommodate, uh, which certainly uh, made us all feel uh, very, very good there and I'm sure that is not unique throughout the nation. But my question, uh, I think, uh, Governor, to you would go more to your state plan. Uh, as you're aware, obviously, uh, all of the different uh, states were preparing their uh, individual um, risk ass assessment plans for the uh, Department of Homeland Security. And uh, how did you find in your state the cooperation from your various units? Did you, uh, did you task that force principally to, uh, I think you called it New York's public security force or your state police? Did they cooperate with the National Guard? How did all of that? We, we had a, an emergency management office, SEMO, the state emergency management office, that responded to the natural disasters and plane crashes and things of that nature. But after September 11th, we created a whole new bureau, the Office of uh, 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 Public Security. Uh, and we gave them oversight over all the different elements, including the National Guard, so that we would have coordination. 
So we don't have the National Guard running our homeland security operation in New York State. We have an entity uh, because we have to integrate not just National Guard, but state police, New York City Police Department, the finest in the world, first responders from around the state. And one of the key elements was integrating the health department so that we can have instantaneous, uh, not instantaneous, but within minutes, the ability to determine if there is a different, if there is an outbreak of a particular illness or where experts are to respond. So, so we created this entity. The National Guard plays a critical role within that entity, but I wouldn't say a disproportionate role. The state police, the health department, local officials, uh, all of them working together. Uh, just one other question. As uh, all of us are trying to make sure that we do get the um, necessary resources into our respective states, the first responders, what have you, uh, did you did you share your state plan with your congressional delegation, or did you have any input uh, there? Uh, we have worked closely with the congressional delegation. I don't know that we sat down and formally said this is what we're doing, uh, but we did give them the parameters and also, of course, uh, the request for federal assistance because this is an extraordinary expense. and. Uh, in New York now, just we're at, oper at, at level yellow, it's still costing us tens of millions of dollars for, as Congressman McHugh was indicating, enhanced security at the nuclear power plants in his district, uh, tr uh, train stations, bridges, tunnels, other uh, very uh, sensitive areas. I see. Thank you very much. And again, thank you for your testimony today and, and your thank service Thank you for to your, your kind words, the Congresswoman. Nation. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cherney, you have the floor. Governor, thank you for coming here today and for your testimony. Uh, in Massachusetts, one of the comments that uh, some of our officers were making was uh, about the armories and the basically physical assets that the Guard has. In New York, do you feel that all of your physical assets are being uh, used to their maximum potential? Or if they are, what exactly are you doing with them other than just the monthly uh, training regimen that's going on? And if they're not, what would you think they might be used for? Well, uh, first let me say from an equipment standpoint, I know there's, that uh, question has been raised. Uh, all of our guard troops that have been deployed overseas were very pleased with the, the level of material and equipment they have been provided. Um, and I think there's been dramatic improvement over the course of the past couple of years in making sure that uh, the necessary equipment and supplies uh, that we need, not just for overseas but also domestically, uh, are available. And with respect to the utilization of the resources, uh, General McGuire, our adjutant general, uh, I don't, I'm unaware that we have any uh, shortages or stockpiles. And I, I we're using them, as you said, in the Guard Help program. Yeah. Uh, and the general reminded me that things like our engineering battalions that haven't been deployed, we're using in things like the Guard Help program so that uh, we are utilizing those assets uh, on an ongoing basis in a way that is uh, constructive to the, to the troops because it gives them experience and training and a sense of mission and helps with the local communities as well. So if you're creative, if we've got the equipment, we're going to use it. Uh, beyond the equipment, the, the armories themselves, the, uh, the buildings, the physical structures, are you maximizing the use of those and how? We have surplus armories because the, the size of the, uh, the forces uh, since over 100, in some cases 150 years ago when those armories were constructed, there are surplus armories. But what we've done is that we've, as we've identified those that no longer serve a, a military purpose, we've turned them over to community groups, we've converted them into uh, recreational centers or community centers, we've sold them off to private entities, and uh, they still serve a very important function. Uh, the evening of September 11th, the armory on 23rd Street in Lower Manhattan served as the family um, uh, uh, command center where family members would go for information. So, so uh, we want to make sure we maintain sufficient armory capability around the state in the case there's a call on them for some emergency service. But to the extent we have surplus armories, we have uh, disposed or, or uh, turned over to communities a large number of them. Thank you. I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Governor, I apologize for being late. We are just Chairman, uh, so you. happy to have you here today and proud of the job you're doing there. And you offer a unique perspective in New York, of course, uh, being the epicenter of, of uh, the happenings in 911. So we appreciate it. I'm going to defer my opening statement so we can give members a question to ask you. Usually we have one or two members at this hearing. So we, uh, on a day when the House is not voting, there's obviously a lot of interest in what you have to say, and we appreciate you being here. Uh, thank you for having me, Chairman. Ms. Blackburn. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Governor, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to be here and to talk with us, those of us uh, that have large numbers of National Guard families in our districts and in our states are very concerned and are very interested in what we're going to do as we look at the National Guard going forward, how they integrate into the active duty. Uh, the issues you've mentioned of predictability, readiness skills, whether it's the equipment, the training, the health, uh, the quality of life issues for the families. And I commend you for your Patriot plan and the way that does address those quality of life and recruitment and retention issues. I'm going to roll my three questions into one for the sake of conserving time and ask you to respond to those because I know you all had significant guard deployments like we are having in Tennessee with our guard being down. And did those guard deployments affect your ability to respond to state missions or disasters or homeland security needs. And then, uh, as you've looked at your state plan, did you build a compact with surrounding states to assist you and back you up if there were to be a need for those resources? And the third part is, how did you, as a state, reimburse the Guard for uh, any Homeland Security missions that they may have um, performed for you? Well, uh, those are three very important questions. First, with respect to the federal deployment, uh, it has never jeopardized our ability uh, to, to respond or be uh, at active status to protect the, the state of New York against any possible attack. As I indicated, right now there are probably 3,700 New York Guards uh, troops uh, that are serving a federal mission, hundreds more uh, serving a state mission, but we have 17,000 uh, plus a naval militia and the New York Guard. So, uh, I don't believe, other than September 12th and for uh, a few weeks after that, we've, there are still units that have not been called upon because of their unique, unique uh, skill sets. So, so uh, we have not been stretched too thin, to use that term. And uh, General Blum and the federal officials have been very, very uh, careful to work closely with our command structure to make sure that uh, uh, the calls they have made are consistent with our need to protect ourselves. Second, with a response to compacts with surrounding states, of course, we are a part of EMAC, the Emergency uh, Management Assistance Compact, with a number of other states. And that was very helpful right after September 11th when emergency teams from other states came to New York and they had the ability to function within New York State free of any uh, constraints they may have had because they were not within their home state. We also have entered into, uh, I have signed executive orders. Uh, just, I'll just give you one example, authorizing Connecticut and New Jersey state police and law enforcement officials to have jurisdiction on the trains between New York and Connecticut and New York and New Jersey. When we're at level orange and at other times that we don't discuss, uh, we have significant uh, additional support and security on the commuter trains in addition to on the subway lines and the commuter trains run not just within New York State, but into New Jersey, into Connecticut. And the governors of New York, of Connecticut and New Jersey have placed their troopers where we would have jurisdiction of our troopers on the trains in Connecticut, and they would have jurisdiction within Penn Station or Grand Central Station, and that has worked uh, very well. And we're continuing to work uh, on a regional concept of support and particularly information sharing. Uh, and we're going to be moving forward on the intelligence and information sharing front with some specific initiatives over the course of the next few weeks. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. We appreciate your, your work and appreciate your time very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Van Hollen. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Governor, uh, for your leadership uh, on, on these many issues. Uh, I also had the opportunity to uh, travel to Iraq uh, in February on a trip that was uh, led by the, the, the chairman of uh, this committee and had the opportunity to talk to many of our National Guards men and women there. And I must say I found their morale uh, was, was high, uh, that they were proud of the service they were doing. They also, though, relied on the term and tour, the, the time for their tour of duty. I mean, they took that seriously as it was given to them, and many of them were discouraged by the fact that their tours were uh, extended uh, beyond the time they'd been originally informed. It obviously had a, uh, a hardship upon their, their families 
uh, back home as well as them. So I think it's important that we work this out so that we can provide greater predictability uh, both to the men and women who are serving overseas but also to their families uh, back home. And I do appreciate uh, what you've done in New York uh, to relieve those burdens. And I want to ask what, if, if there's a member of the, the New York State government who is uh, deployed overseas, in addition to f playing the pay gap, you also guarantee their, their position will be held open when they return. Is that right? That's correct. We hold their position open. Right. And, in, and a number of states have done this. In my home state of Maryland has, has done this. And uh, their experience is that has been that uh, they are able to cover this pay gap without having to request additional appropriations, that those agencies have been able to fill uh, uh, meet those demands without having a, a lot of additional costs. Was that your experience? That has been our experience. W uh, but I, I just want to uh, uh, clarify uh, something in response to what Congressman Lanto said er earlier. Uh, we provide the pay gap be when you are a state employee. We did not mandate that for local governments, and we do not do that for private employers. So, so if you are a state employee, we work with the public employee unions. We provide that pay gap. We hold the slot open, and we've been able to be able to to minimize the fiscal impact to the state of that particular benefit. Right. I, mean, I just think what you've done is a, a good model for what we can be doing at the federal level with respect to federal employees, as, as Congressman Lantos. Uh, uh, has suggested, uh, and I think we can do it with, with minimal impact uh, on the budget. Let, let me ask you, because a lot of states are, are facing multiple demands on, the, on the, their National Guards people, as you suggested, we have this function where the Guards serve within the states to respond to emergencies, uh, now more and more to homeland security demands, and at the same time we have many being deployed overseas. Have you encountered any difficulties in terms of the competing demands on the same resources, and when those competing demands occur, which take precedent? I mean, how, how do you decide uh, with, in, in, in discussions? We, with we, really, we really have not seen that, because uh, General Blum, as I indicated, has been very, very cooperative in working with our command structure, General McGuire and the others, uh, as, as the, the New York uh, members of the Guard are deployed for a federal mission. So we haven't seen that. There is one area where we are requesting additional help, and that's our civil support team, which has the ability, the high-tech equipment, to, to not just uh, respond, but to monitor for uh, uh, chemical, biological, or radiological weapons. We only have one of those teams. It hasn't been called upon for federal service, but we call upon it regularly uh, to monitor and to proactively protect. And, and that is one area where uh, we would very much like the authorization to have a second uh, civil support team that would allow us to enhance that capability and not keep relying on that one unit. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Governor, I think it's the time has come. Uh, it, you said 11 o'clock. Um, and uh, we're going to let you go at 11. And I appreciate it very much of what you've been able to add to this. Um, and we may uh, want to get back to you with some ideas as we move through. But this has been very, very helpful for us, and we appreciate it. Well, thank you very much, Chairman. It's been an honor to testify before the commi committee. What you're doing is extremely important, and I have no doubt you would do it extremely well. well thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. Well, we will have about a three, four minute recess as we get our next panel. We're going to move to our second panel of witnesses, and I want to thank you all for, for taking time from your busy schedules to appear today. I think you've heard Governor Pataki uh, from the back. Uh, we have today the Honorable Paul McHale, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Defense, and a former member of this body. And Paul, welcome back in a, in a different role here, but it's good to have you here. Uh, the Honorable Thomas F. Hall, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Reserve Affairs. Lieutenant General H. Stephen Blum, the Chief of the National Guard Bureau and Major General John Love, the Special Assistant to the uh, Combatant Commander for National Guard Affairs, United States Northern Command. It's a policy of this committee that all witnesses be sworn before you testify, so if you'd rise with me and raise your right hand. Solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Uh, members deferred opening. 
uh, defer opening statements. I'm going to just put my statement in the record, ask unanimous consent, and that will uh, ask unanimous consent members put their statements in the record. Let me recognize Mr. Schrock, who do you want to wait now or do you want to wait until I start questioning with you? Uh, we'll go through this panel and then I'll, I'll start with Mr. Schrock's uh, question. Uh, Paul, uh, or I guess Mr. Secretary now, uh, welcome back. It's, it's good to have you here and uh, I know you've worked hard at this. Uh, thanks for being here. Mr. Chairman, it's good to be back. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the committee, it is an honor and a privilege to appear before this body. To be entrusted with national security responsibilities at any time, but especially at this point in our country's history, is a solemn and sacred duty. From past experience, I fully appreciate and respect your oversight obligations pursuant to Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, although I have to tell you it's a little more challenging on this side of the table than it was when I sat up there and asked the questions. My goal today is to provide the committee with a candid, accurate assessment of our current homeland defense capabilities and to describe emerging DOD mission requirements with particular emphasis upon reserve component capabilities. Because I have submitted my formal testimony for the record, I would like to provide only a brief introduction at this point and thereafter allow maximum time for member questions. I appear before you today in my capacity as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Defense. My position was created by Public Law 107-314, the National Defense Authorization Act of 2003. The statutory duty assigned to the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Defense is, quote, the overall supervision of the homeland defense activities of the department, end of quote. I was nominated by President Bush in January 2003 and confirmed by the Senate one month later. As a result, I have been serving in this office for just a little over a year. In the interim, much has happened. Although my written testimony focuses in some detail upon the organizational changes within the Department of Defense following the attack of September 11, 2001, I think the members of this committee are primarily interested in the recent steps we have taken to ensure the physical safety of our citizens, their property, and our constitutional freedoms. The painful losses of September the 11th produced not only grief, but resolute action. Each day since September the 11th, the men and women of the North American Aerospace Defense Command, NORAD, have patrolled the airspace over Canada and the United States. In a completely integrated effort of U.S. and Canadian capabilities, the United States Air Force, Air Force Reserve, and Air Guard have protected the skies over major metropolitan areas, critical infrastructure, government facilities, and historic monuments. These dedicated professionals have executed over 34,000 air defense sorties and responded to over 1,700 requests from the Federal Aviation Administration to intercept potential air threats. That is an extraordinary achievement. In fiscal year 2004 alone, the Air National Guard has flown 1,909 sorties and logged 6,926 hours to guard our nation's skies. The number of flights and their location changes daily, and each day's flight data is shared in advance with the Department of Homeland Security. This level of air security is unprecedented in our nation's history. Nearly every homeland defense exercise that we now conduct includes a threat scenario involving a terrorist takeover of a commercial airliner. As a result, our air defense training is realistic, focused, and subject to well-understood rules of engagement. We have implemented similar improvements in our domestic land defense capabilities. While fully recognizing that domestic counterterrorism is a lead law enforcement mission, we, have now, we now have active duty soldiers and Marines on alert every hour of every day, prepared to deploy to any location within the United States where a land defense against a terrorist attack might be required. Such quick reaction forces did not exist on September 11, 2001. They do now, and they are both trained and ready. Even more importantly, we are working closely with the National Guard Bureau to ensure that Army Guard forces will be mission ready to provide immediate land security forces within their own states. In my judgment, the protection of critical infrastructure will likely become a core National Guard mission during the next decade. It is also important to note that DOD has recently been assigned with the signing of Homeland Security Presidential Directive 7, an important responsibility in the protection of the defense industrial base. The achievement of this new mission will require close coordination of private and public, military and civilian security capabilities. The task is both enormous and essential. We now recognize that a 21st century maritime defense requires a common operating picture of the maritime domain, real-time tracking of threat vessels, 
appropriate ships and resources to support maritime intercept operations on the high seas against terrorists potentially armed with weapons of mass destruction, and command and control structure which maximizes both Navy and Coast Guard capabilities. Our goal is to defeat every, every enemy maritime threat with an integrated layered defense long before such threats are able to enter our ports. To that end, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld recently signed an expanded maritime intercept operations execute order. Through realistic maritime exercises and unprecedented Navy Coast Guard cooperation, we are making daily progress with that goal. Similar improvements have been made with regard to DOD's ability to support civilian authorities following a terrorist attack. 32 National Guard weapons of mass destruction, civil support teams have been trained, equipped, and certified by the Secretary of Defense. 12 new teams will be created this year. We are planning to establish a total of 55 civil support teams, sufficient to ensure that every state and territory will be served by a team. If a more substantial WMD response is required, we have established, equipped, and organized large joint task forces at dispersed locations throughout the United States, sufficient to ensure that we will be able to respond to multiple near simultaneous terrorist attacks involving weapons of mass destruction. Although this capability is not fully developed, we are working hard and with a sense of urgency to get there. In my view, multiple simultaneous attacks are not only possible, they are consistent with terrorist operational doctrine. Even in the absence of a large-scale enemy attack, the Department of Defense civil support responsibility is substantial. During the past year, DOD acted on 75 separate civil support requests from more than 20 civilian agencies, including the January 4th deployment of the Marine Corps' Chemical Biological Incident Response Force to the Dirksen Building when ricin was detected in Senator Frist's office. That mission was executed at the request of the Capitol Police. And finally, we at DOD recognize that an effective defense against terrorist activity requires a close daily partnership between our department and the newly created Department of Homeland Security. Our missions are complementary and mutually reinforcing. To make certain that partnership is a reality, employees from my office now work full-time in the Homeland Security Operations Center. A defense coordination office has been established by DOD personnel at DHS. A memorandum of agreement for mutual support has been negotiated between the two departments. And I meet routinely and regularly with senior DHS leadership, including a one-hour meeting yesterday with Admiral Jim Loy, the Deputy Secretary. Our Homeland Security and Homeland security and homeland defense exercise programs have now been fully integrated. The scenarios are challenging and involve complete interagency participation. Mr. Chairman, this summary should make it clear that the Department of Defense, working with our partners in the public and private sectors at the local, state, and national levels, is fully committed to the most capable homeland defense ever planned or executed in our country's history. Despite great progress, we are not comfortable. We are not satisfied. Rather, we are dedicated with a real sense of urgency to ever-improving homeland defense capabilities. In that effort, our men and women in uniform stand in common cause with the members of this committee. Victory in the global war on terrorism is a national imperative, our generation's greatest challenge. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to your questions and those of the members of the committee. Thank you very much. Mr. Hall, thanks for being with us. Thank you, uh, Chairman, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here and speak to the committee. I'm pleased to be here today with my colleague Paul McHale and with Generals Blum and Love to discuss the role of the National Guard in overseas and homeland operations. Our Guard and Reserve make up 46 percent of our military, or some 1.2 million service members. Since 9-1-1, we've mobilized a total of 340,000 service members. This equates to 40 percent of our force and it's the largest mobilization since Korea. Today, as we meet, there are over 165,000 reserve and guard members who are mobilized. Although 60% of our reserve force has not been touched, we share everyone's concerns about the same thing, and that's the stress on our force. Just as the active force is the first to deploy in support of U.S. operations abroad, the National Guard is often the first military force to deploy in support of most Homeland Security requirements. The National Guard is a citizen soldier force that can be activated by the governor in support of state emergencies and also federalized to support national contingency requirements. 
The governor can employ the National Guard under state active duty or upon approval of the Secretary of Defense in Title 32 of the U.S. Code. National Guard can, of course, be also federalized under the provisions of Title 10 U.S. Code. This unique triple status makes the National Guard a cost-effective, flexible force that can be employed in a variety of circumstances. The Guard's capability was demonstrated in the aftermath of the September 11th attacks. Immediately after the attacks, as we have heard and know, the National Guard responded. The National Guard assets took to the skies to secure our airspace, and the local Guard forces were rapidly sent to the World Trade Center and the Pentagon to assist with security and recovery efforts. Shortly thereafter, the President asked the governors to use their guardsmen to secure our airports at federal expense. They responded in a matter of hours by deploying their guardsmen in Title 32 status at over 440 airports. In addition, many of our governors ordered their guardsmen in state active duty to secure critical infrastructure facilities such as bridges, power plants, and government buildings. Many of those state security missions continue today. Our National Guard personnel were activated in 12 states under Title 10 to augment security along our nation's borders. Their missions ensure that the commerce continued to flow while the vital entry ways were protected. Today, there are over 100,000 Air and Army National Guardsmen and women mobilized in support of Operations Noble Eagle, Enduring Freedom, and Iraqi Freedom. They are flying air patrols, performing force protection duties here in the United States, flying refueling missions over Central Asia, and are on the ground in both Iraq and Afghanistan. As expected, the National Guard conducted and continues to conduct all missions in an exceptional manner. The fight against terrorism and the protection of our homeland will be protected, protracted endeavors, much like the Cold War. To that end, many outside policy experts, independent panels, and analytical studies have advocated expanding roles for the National Guard and Homeland Security. Some have even suggested that the National Guard should be reoriented, re-equipped, and retained retained solely for the Homeland Security mission. The reality is that there has been no recent national security change that justifies the need to establish a separate role for the National Guard to perform Homeland Security related missions under new statutes and administrative guidelines. There are already sufficient legal mechanisms in place that enable state and territorial governors to employ their National Guard forces in support of local authorities to meet a wide range of existing missions. The National Guard is an integral part of the Air Force and Army total force mission capability. Their roles are vital to the survival of this nation. The position of the Department of Defense is that the National Guard will remain a dual missioned military force. This concludes my statement. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, thank you Mike, very much, uh, General Baum. Good morning, Chairman Davis. Thank you for the, and other members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, address this body this morning. And uh, I'd ask that my written testimony be entered into the record. Without objection. As we appear here this morning before you, there are 149,000 citizen soldiers and airmen deployed all over the globe in the current global war on terrorism. And for the last two and a half years since 9-11, the National Guard has maintained and sustained that level of contribution to the war fight, both here at home and abroad. Your National Guard is no longer questioned about its relevance. Today, our worst critics can only call us overused or essential to the safety and security of our nation. The modern-day National Guard has been in the homeland defense business now for 367 years. Uh, our homeland defense efforts actually predate us as a nation. We plan to remain in that effort and we call that job one or priority number one. But defending the homeland is not always done only here at home. Some of that homeland defense has to be conducted to use a sports analogy as an away game or the scheduled away game that you see us participating with our active duty counterparts and the other reserve components in a joint multinational interagency and intergovernmental effort overseas in Iraq, Afghanistan, Kosovo, Bosnia, and other places in the world. We have to change the National Guard, however, because it is not exactly optimized for the current threat that we're facing right now and future threats that we foresee on the horizon. As a modern-day National Guard, we can answer no-notice calls by our governors to respond to catastrophic events created by either Mother Nature man-made accidents or acts of terrorism here at home.
But we have to change the National Guard the way we train it, organize it, and most importantly, the way we resource it so that it can be an operational reserve force that can be used in a joint and expeditionary overseas war fight and supplement our active components when necessary. We are not structured correctly to do that today, and we are working very hard to move as fast as we can with a great sense of urgency to become a relevant, ready, reliable, and accessible force that is needed by our combatant commanders around the world. The Congress's National Guard and Reserve Equipment Account will remain a very essential tool in helping us accomplish this effort. As you have heard Governor Pataki say, and the two previous secretaries that have testified before me in their opening statements, I am proud to tell you that the National Guard has met every requirement that it has been asked to perform since 9-11 and even before that. Service in the National Guard has always been honorable, but it is particularly rewarding today because we are truly defending our nation, our way of life, our liberties, our form of government, and our future. And we're very proud to stand and answer the call to colors to do that. But to do this, I have to tell you, we are committed to transformation or changing the Guard from what it was designed to do to what it needs to be designed to be today. We are transforming the Guard today to be a more joint and effective organization from the very top to the very bottom, building it from the bottom up, and that's the essence of the Standing Joint Force Headquarters that were described by Governor Pataki and the Secretaries. And we are developing capabilities that will be needed to defend the homeland, support homeland security efforts here at home, and to support combatant commanders overseas in the war fight over outside of our nation's borders. We want to give better predictability to our soldiers, to their families, to their employers, as you heard discussed earlier. And we've built a model for this that we think will accomplish a better predictability model, and soldiers, their families, and employers will know in, on a more uh, routine basis when they can expect to be called, how long they can be expected to be employed, and when they will return home, and then how soon again they will be asked to answer the call to colors for another extended duration deployment. We are needing the needs of our elected officials and our uniform leaders. We are meeting the, me the mandate to operate as a seamless organization that can perform both the state mission and the federal mission and do them simultaneously if necessary. And to be able to do this in a joint interagency, intergovernmental, and multinational environment if required. Your National Guard is focusing so that it ensures that every governor and every combatant commander gets the right force mix from the National Guard and the right kinds of units with the right kinds of capabilities, modern equipment that are interoperable and beyond interoperable are actually interchangeable parts with their active components, whether it be Air Force or Army, Air National Guard or Army National Guard, and that we need to redistribute these capabilities so that they are resident in every state and territory of this great nation. We are transforming along with the Army and the Air Force. This is not an independent effort. We are shoulder to shoulder on this. There is no daylight between the National Guard and the active components as once existed. The Army recognizes that there are 18 divisions in the United States Army, 10 on active duty, 8 in the National Guard. The United States Army hopes to grow to 84 brigades. 34 of these brigades will be resident in the Army National Guard. We are similarly full partners with the United States Air Force and their initiatives to modernize and transform and develop modularity so that the Air National Guard and the Army National Guard can truly be plug and play elements of their active duty counterparts. Bottom line is your National Guard is committed to doing what is right for the United States of America. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, General Love. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the committee, on behalf of General Eberhard and the, the men and women of U.S. Uh, Northern Command, thank you for the opportunity to be here to discuss the National Guard's role in the vital issues of homeland defense and homeland security. As you've heard from Secretary McHale, Secretary Hall, and Lieutenant General Blum, every Department of Defense office and headquarters charged 
with defending our homeland has looked very carefully at the role the National Guard should play in deterring and preventing attacks on our homeland and mitigating any attacks that might occur. The National Guard Bureau, under the guidance and direction of General Blum, has begun a number of what I believe to be critical initiatives to respond to the realities of our post-9-11 world. Historically, the National Guard headquarters in each state has largely acted to fulfill the services needs to organize, train, and equip airmen and soldiers to fight our nation's war somewhere other than in our homeland. It was always an additional mission to provide guardsmen to meet the needs of their states in responding to natural disasters. That res response seldom called for skills other than those wartime training had already provided. All of our assumptions regarding the use of our Cold War force in reserve were predicated upon the United States having and retaining the initiative as to where to fight and when to fight. This is not the case in the global war on terrorism. We no longer have the initiative and we must be prepared to respond anywhere within our homeland, knowing that any delay in that response may mean the loss of lives and those are American lives. The National Guard is four deployed in 3,300 locations across our nation, and wherever a terrorist attack may occur, it is likely that the National Guard will be the first military force on the scene. The response to a terrorist attack will not be analogous to the response to a flood. It will require specialized training and equipment, as well as a unique command and control structure that is responsive to the realities of a WMD attack. By any measure, this change is truly transformational. The National Guard headquarters in each state must now deal not only with its historic roles of organize, train, and equip, and deploy, it must now be an operational headquarters that provides not only a response to a crisis in their state, but provides NORTHCOM and the nation with a clear picture of what has happened and what is needed to save lives and property. We must examine closely the statutory authorities under which the National Guard responds to an attack in our homeland and how best it may be utilized to prevent those attacks. We at NORTHCOM are looking closely at changes that may be necessary in Title 32 of the U.S. Code. We believe that certain circumstances may dictate that National Guard units perfor should perform homeland defense or homeland security duties in a federal status other than Title 10. It may be far more effective for the Guard to remain under the command of the governor of a state as opposed to being federalized and placed under the command of NORTHCOM. Guardsmen know the local territory, know the local first responders, exercise with those who will be engaged on the part of the state emergency response system, and under Title 32 utilization can be accessed far more quickly. Response in our homeland is all about speed. We cannot wait for help from afar is there if there is help close at hand. We must train and equip that help so that it can offer the kind of assistance that is needed and so that it can do so with proper training and equipment. If the mission is a federal mission, we must find a way to budget for that mission and make those funds available to a governor to pay his or her guardsmen. Of course, states must assure the Congress that its appropriations are being used as it directs but that's not a complicated undertaking. The Guard performs counter-drug missions in a similar manner, and that program has worked well for 15 years. The war on terrorism demands that we look for innovative ways to utilize these force, those forces that are closest to any crisis. That said, it is not really innovative at all. The National Guard has been responding to crises in their communities for more than 367 years, since 1636, when the Massachusetts militia mustered in December of that year in Salem. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and thank you and your colleagues for your continued commitment to armed forces. Thank you very much. I thank the panel for their testimony. We're going to move into the question. I'm going to start first with the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Souter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I first. Um, I want to make sure I get a couple of comments on the record. If we have to get the answers written, I'd appreciate it. First, I want to thank uh, Secretary uh, McHale for his comments on narcotics. Uh, it's, it's impossible to do that task without the assistance of the Department of Defense uh, on JTF-6. Uh, 
There's an interrelationship where the training of our guard and reserve and military component is absolutely essential to our south border. If we're long term going to protect our homeland security on the south border, uh, I mean, right now a million people are making it across. That's why we need immigration reform. We need a number of things. But bottom line is we are not secure at all there. And without your help, uh, it would be inconceivable even to do it. I want to raise again, and we need your particular help. We've raised this with the Department of Defense. In the Barry Goldwater Range in the southwest part of Arizona, uh, we have a problem with uh, air. We don't have aerostat protection. We have high yield monitoring that can feed in, but we need low level. The U.S. Customs, which is now under Homeland Security, wants to fly planes there in a five mile radius like they do the rest of our border, but have not because it's an Air Force training range. But the jets shouldn't be that close to the international border anyway, or we have a problem. We need to get this worked out. We have repeatedly been told, oh, we're working on it, but we need a solution because what's going to happen is we squeeze other parts of the border. The illegals, not to mention narcotic trafficking, is going to push into that range, and the first one that gets killed, you have, are going to endanger your entire training facilities there. We have got to secure that portion of the border, not only for other reasons of the United States, but for even keeping our range open. And we really need your help on the Air Force range. But I thank you for raising the narcotics uh, issues. I want to uh, mention a, a couple of other things, and then if the chairman, with the chairman's indulgence, indulgence, maybe you can raise this. I have heard from the Guard and from the manufacturer that the Humvees that the Guard takes over uh, to uh, Iraq are being left there because of shortages of the Humvees. And I want to know if this is true, because it's going to long-term impact our training uh, with Guard people in the States if we're having to leave the Humvees in Iraq. Uh, and if it's uh, true, uh, uh, which we have heard from a number of different people in a number of different places, then are you requesting more Humvees for uh, Guard and Reserve training? Secondly, um, I um, I was pleased to hear that we're trying to get better at communicating to our groups long term uh, whether they're going to be uh, deployed again, not only the, the first time. But I want to raise a couple questions. My understanding is if 60 percent have not been utilized, a logical question will be before others go back, um, will that 60 percent be utilized? Or, more, or are we talking about some of these units didn't have um, didn't get 100 percent utilized, and the 60 percent of the guard that hasn't been utilized, in fact, um, may be in that unit, and if that unit's called up, they may not be utilized again. In other words, I've just had a group that's been forward deployed of 700 Army Guard in Fort Wayne, Indiana, that was a specially trained battalion. Uh, uh, are we adequately communicating, will that group be called up again because of its special training? I have a reserve group that is going up over to Afghanistan in about, they may already be in flight, it's within the next days, um, that they haven't been forward deployed since the Layette Gulf, but they are the only artillery uh, ammunition support group going into Afghanistan and they're replacing all the other units on the ground. It seems to me, if our premise is correct, that many of us feel that the war on terrorism is not going away and we're going to continue to use Guard and Reserve, certain specially trained units or short needs may be facing continuous redeployment, even if you have 60 percent that aren't. Could you elaborate on that? Because we need to be able to look at, uh, should we have specially targeted benefits for those who are higher risk? How do we communicate this if you join certain units? Uh, uh, because it doesn't seem to be an even deployment risk uh, uh, in the combat zones. I certainly would uh, take a couple of them and ask General Bum. You hit upon the exact uh, problem that we have. As we analyze the force uh, over the past 19 months that I've been there, we have discovered that we have used um, about 28,000 of our people over and over again, two, three, and four times. And that's about 3.3 percent of our force. But uh, they're in specialties like civil affairs, military police, air traffic control. So it is very clear to us that we need to rebalance. And within that 60 percent that we mentioned are many of the specialties that are not required today. And so uh, we have an excess of artillery. So the services are all committed to rebalancing 100,000 billets and taking the specialties that were targeted towards the Cold War that are not used in today's warfare, moving those over, building a bigger base so that we don't have to continually call up the same people all the time. 
As of this year, we're about halfway there. We have 50,000 billets, 10,000 in 03, 20,000 in 04, and 20,000 in 05. We have another 50,000 to go, and the services are moving as fast as they can to convert those kinds of specialties, and one of the areas is excess artillery. So we're concerned about that. Uh, we want to minimize the stress, and we certainly, every time we mobilize a unit, one of the things my office asks is, when were they mobilized before, how long ago, and are there other alternatives that we have rather than mobilize them, either through uh, other services, through a joint solution. So that is always part of that equation. We want to reduce that stress on the force. With respect to the Humvees, I think you are absolutely right that uh, the up-armored ones are being left there. And I think it's uh, a question that all the chiefs, including General Myers, have looked at. If there are not enough, do you want them where the actual combat is going on rather than in training? The answer is you'd like them both places. As you know, the industrial base is pushing as hard as it can to uh, get the up armored Humvees out, but right now they are kept there so that the people participating in combat can have them. We certainly would like to have them at the National Training Center and other places, and we're moving towards getting those for training. I, I want to clarify something for the record there, because this is important for us as members of Congress. As somebody, uh, the AM general facility that makes the Humvees is at the edge of my district. It's not my district, but my district is the biggest part suppliers. They can produce more. They can produce 150 more a month now, up armored. The question is, is, are we going to allocate the funds to do that, and is the administration going to request it? And that's really what the debate is. Well, I certainly take that for the record, sir, that they have that capacity. And I don't know whether General Blum has any comments on the Humvees or not. My, com my comments on the up-armored Humvees would be this. The National Guard has shipped every single up-armored Humvee that was in the United States of America that we controlled overseas so that the soldiers that are put in harm's way have the best protection to perform their mission. I don't want to see an up-armored Humvee in the United States of America until every single one that's required overseas in a war fight is delivered into the war fight. As I cannot talk to uh, what AMC can produce or what the Congress wants to uh, uh, provide in the way of funds and who's going to request that, but I will tell you, with the assets that I control, I put the protection of soldiers, number one, and I put that protection in theater where they need the protection. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Ms. Norton? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, D.C. National Guards, the guardsmen were home, a trucking company where we lost uh, one man, came home yesterday. We had a big uh, ceremony. I'm one of their greatest supporters with great appreciation for them. Uh, I'm going to ask Mr. McHale to help me uh, to get for the District of Columbia what Mr. Pataki indicated in his testimony has been so helpful to him, and I quote from you, uh, we need to ensure that troops activated under Title 32 status remain under the authority and control of the state's governor to ensure maximum flexibility and effective deployment. Now, the, the District of Columbia National Guard uh, comes totally under the President of the United States. It's as if this were 1800. Um, it's, it's really dangerous today uh, to have a situation in the nation's capital where the kind of flexibility that Mr. B Mr. Pataki testified to is not even possible here. And it, I have a bill to, 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 to put the National Guard under the mayor. If it's not to be that, at least this city, which must be target number one in the world, ought to have the kind of flexibility uh, that uh, Mr. Pataki was. I want to ask you to work with, with my office to try to get some of that flexibility uh, here in the nation's capital when where more is at stake than the, the 600,000 people who live here, but the entire federal presence as well, and where that flexibility is simply not available to us. Uh, my question really goes, uh, however, to the mix. Uh, I, I very much appreciate what you are trying to do with the National Guard. I mean, it's almost like zero budgeting. Gentlemen, I think you just got to start all over again, as if the old concept of the militia, which is what we've been operating under, uh, is, 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 is just lay, lay aside and we begin again in the world of post 9-11, particularly since I understand uh, that within a few months we may have as many as 40 percent of the National Guard. But, but 40 percent of our troops in Iraq from the National Guard. Nobody contemplated that even a year ago. Um, uh, uh, in, in Mr. Pataki's testimony, um, and by the way, the GAO graph 
uh, showing this escalation of the Army National Guard. Nobody believes that these men and women were prepared for this kind of escalation uh, to alert and combat. And in contrast to your testimony, the GAO, and let me read from the GAO, says DOD has not fully defined requirements, readiness standards, and readiness measures for the Homeland Security missions it will lead or support. Um, the Guard's readiness, preparedness, specifically for Homeland missions, is unknown. Then it says, and this is my concern, states are concerned that continuing deployments reduce the Guard's preparedness and availability for all its homeland security and natural disaster missions. Now, Mr. Pataki was brought here to testify. He is totally unrepresentative of the governors uh, of, of the United States at this point. He, wonderful testimony. But there's no doubt he called General Blum's name over and over again. There is no doubt that following 9-11, you were careful about what you did with the National Guard in the state of New York. And I hope that the next time we will have a more typical uh, a governor here so that we can really find out uh, what is happening with the governors. Um, at least, uh, 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 for example, in neighboring New Jersey, 70 percent of the National Guard has been deployed. Uh, in this city, 40 percent has been deployed. These folks are in Iraq. Now, the governor testified proudly since he's been governor, he's been governor for two terms, eight national disasters, four, he's been able four plane crashes, 11 crippling blizzards, two major wildfires, et cetera. We, ha we just had a, a terrible um, hurricane, uh, Hurricane Isabel. Uh, it is very hard for me to believe if we had a representative governor here, he would be able to say, uh, particularly since there's no doubt he wouldn't have been given the special consideration that New York was entitled to, that he could handle any disaster uh, that, that, came, um, that came forward. And while you, uh, so I need to know, particularly in light of what the, 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 the uh, GAO has said, even about um, the definition of requirements, I need to know, which I find at, at, in real contrast with your own testimony, I need to know what we what we what we're supposed to do in in the home front when leave aside the deployment in Iraq we've got them deployed also for homeland security and then they're supposed to do the disasters as well and I, I still have no understanding of how how yeah. this in fact is going to occur how long it will take you to get to this rebalanced na national guard or how a typical governor is supposed to operate during this period when that governor happens not to be New York state Congressman if, I... Congressman, if I may, what I'll do is divide your question into a couple of different parts. A portion of your question falls within the area of responsibility that's been assigned to me. A portion of the question is really within the area of responsibility assigned to Secretary Hall and General Blum. But let me take the part that, for which I am accountable. With regard to the command and control of the D.C. National Guard, the first part of the comment that, that you raised, in order to achieve a closer partnership between the Department of Defense and the operational requirements assigned to the D.C. National Guard, there is an ongoing review, not yet completed, within the Department of Defense that would consider the possibility of transferring that responsibility from one individual to another. You correctly noted that ultimately the President of the United States is responsible for the federal missions assigned to the D.C. National Guard. And At for that matter, can nationalize any National Guard? I, I'm sorry. And can national on any national guard he wants to. Yeah, the, the general lady's time expired. So answer her question. We need to. I'll make it very brief, Mr. Chairman. What what's underway right now is the possibility of transferring the responsibility from the current executive agent, who is the Secretary of the Army, and who has had historically the same responsibility with regard to the D.C. National Guard that a governor of a state would normally have with regard to his or her National Guard. The person or the office that is being considered is a transfer from the Secretary of the Army to my office. My office was created by Congress last year. It has overall supervision of all of the Homeland Defense responsibilities of the Department of Defense, and there is a possibility that that responsibility would transfer from the Secretary of the Army 
to me or to my successors. Uh, I have met with Mayor Williams. I have talked to him about the responsibilities of the D.C. Guard. We are eager to make that an effective partnership. Uh, secondly, with regard to Homeland Defense missions, we agree with the GAO assessment. Those missions have not yet formally been uh, defined within the necessary documents. However, uh, that's because we're new. Uh, NORTHCOM is a new capability. My office is brand new. What we have done operationally is define those missions and pursuant to the uh, strategic planning guidance that's been uh, reviewed by the Department of Defense, by June of this year, we must develop and publish a comprehensive strategy for homeland defense, which in turn will define the requirements that are necessary to support those missions. Now, frankly, there won't be many surprises. The missions that we will be including are important missions that we have developed during the past two years. The air caps that protect our airspace, critical infrastructure protection and the involvement of the National Guard in meeting that mission requirement. The CSTs, 32 of which we now have, uh, an additional uh, 23, I believe, are scheduled over the next two years, including 12 within the next year. The missions are well understood by NORTHCOM. Many of them are being executed today, and the document reflecting the development of those missions will be published by June of this year. Thank you very much. Let well, me could just, the other part of my no, question be answered, uh, Mr. Chairman? Let, the Chairman's going to make a comment. Uh, we asked a number of governors to appear, including the Governor of New Jersey, uh, Ms. Norton. We asked the Democratic Governor of Michigan to appear as well. We asked the Democratic Governor of Virginia to appear. We would have had a panel had we had them. I'm very grateful we had Governor Pataki, because not only did he have 9-11, he's one of the longest serving governors in the nation. He's had blackouts. He's had transportation, weather issues, and everything else. And I think referring to him a more typical, uh, I take exception to that statement. It, he, gave, he came here on his own accord, and I think sitting here and bashing him is really not uh, Mr. appropriate. Mr. Chairman, I didn't bash the, the, the just gentleman Mr. from Mr. Virginia. Mr. I'm sorry, Mr. Oh. You, have, you have made a personal attack on me, Mr. No, Chairman. No, I, I, did not I was answering something, Ms. Norton. No, I simply we gave we you five extra minutes, gentlelady from Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our panel. I appreciate your willingness to come and visit with us on these issues today. Uh, the health of the National Guard, the strength of the National Guard is very important to all of us, and I have two questions. My first question I am going to direct to Mr. Hall and General Bloom, and then, Mr. McHale, I will come to you with my second question. I do want to be brief in consideration of everyone's time. Um, one of the things that I am very concerned about, Mr. Hall and General Blum, is the 168th out of Lebanon, Tennessee, which is military police. Now, we have talked a lot this morning about predictability, about readiness, and the quality of life with the families, and uh, Governor Pataki was very forthcoming with what he's doing to address those issues in New York. The 168th out of Lebanon was activated in December 2002. They were deployed in June of 2003, and they're in the group that just got extended for another 90 to 100 days. And this is of great concern to us because of the families that are involved in the length of this deployment. Uh, we know that retention and readiness is important, but I think the um, I'm very concerned for the families of the 168th and how this lengthy deployment does affect them. What I want to know is what you plan to do as you restructure that will keep that from happening again. Then, uh, Mr. McHale, for your answer, the question I would like for you to answer for me, as we look at this restructuring and we talk about having missions that are complementary, mutually reinforcing, the one thing we've not focused on a lot in this hearing is going forward with the implementation, what the estimated cost of uh, stepping up the readiness. Um, and as we talk about cost, are you looking at a five-year frame or a 10-year frame? Have you given an estimate to uh, the restructuring on uh, the increased time and what that increased training time is going to cost us? Um, the different units, the equipping of these, and how what that cost is going to be. So um, backing it up, Mr. McHale, I'll ask you to speak to the cost, but first, Mr. Um, Hall and General Blum, if you will address um, the restructuring to keep from happening what has happened with the 168th. 
we were all very concerned with having to have that extension. We worry about the families. I spent 34 years in the military, uh, deployed all the time as an active duty person, and, uh, and I worried about my family at that point, and we are continuing to do that. That decision was made because of the combatant commander felt that he needed to have it, and as uh, Secretary Rumsfeld and General Myers said, we have to provide him the force, and so it was a very difficult decision. We have over 6,000 Guardsmen and Reservists, including the ones you mentioned who are involved in the 20,000. Both the uh, Guard and the Army Reserve are having town halls, meeting with the families, dedicated to every month, reconnecting with the families, trying to help them and give them as much assistance as we possibly can. Uh, and, and what we're doing to prohibit this or to mitigate it for the future is what I mentioned earlier. We are restructuring, and in this case, building more uh, military police battalions, 18 provisional battalions, I'll let uh, General Blum talk about it, from excess capacity and artillery and others. We want to build a larger base so that we don't have to go back and touch the same groups or extend them. So we're accelerating that rebalancing and building more military police because we know for sure in conflicts in the future, military police are going to be needed and we need to build a larger base. So that's a major focus point along with civil affairs. And I'll ask General Blum if he has something. Uh, Congresswoman Blackburn, you're exactly right. Um, nobody liked what happened to the 168th. Nobody wanted that to happen. Uh, unfortunately, we're in a war where we don't control all of the conditions. And unfortunately, they have a special skill set that is in short supply and was needed a little bit longer in theater to keep the mission in theater from becoming at risk. They, those soldiers, because they are so superb, because they are so well-trained, because they have such good situational awareness and have been conditioned to the environment, they are hugely effective and very valuable to the combatant commander on the ground. The combatant commander asks for a very small number. Now, if you're the one, that, is, that number's one too many. If you're the family member, the employer, or the service member that's been extended, if it's even one, that's one too many. But it's a very small number of units and, 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 and National Guardsmen that have been asked to extend beyond the already extended one-year boots-on-the-ground policy. They will be there as short as possible. I am in communication with the ground commander almost weekly to make sure that they are closely examining the absolute necessity and requirement for the 168th to stay in theater. And they will be released as soon as they can possibly be released. How, to answer your question directly, how do you keep that from happening again? I have to develop the right kind of capabilities in the right numbers of units distributed across the nation so that Tennessee doesn't have to pay or bear an unfair burden in the defense of this nation. And right now, we're not set up exactly perfect to optimize our, our shelf stockage, to use a civilian term. And I need more shelf stockage of the right kinds of units and capabilities in the right modularity that we're, that we're attempting to develop as fast as we can. Now, we have converted 18 artillery units from around the country, and this month, they will be certified as military police units. And then they will be available to go into the rotational base so that I can get, when the, two, when the 168th comes home, I can look those soldiers and citizen soldiers in the eye and tell them and their families and their employers they will probably not have to face another call up for about five or six years of, a, of an extended duration overseas. And that's, that's, that's the best I can do. And it's not going to be, I won't have that perfect probably for another 24 months but we will be in a much better position by the end of this month to provide additional MPs into subsequent rotations, which means to the 168th, they don't have to go back so soon, or maybe ever. Thank you. General, these times expired. Thank you very much. Gentleman from California, Mr. Lantos. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Before I raise my point, let me express my admiration for the work all of you gentlemen are doing. You know we are fully supportive of what you're doing. In the 24 years I've served in this body, I've been involved in many policy disputes, but I've never had a weird, in, inexplicable dispute with uh, an administration spokesperson uh, that I have in this instance. 
So let me try to frame my question with great respect, but in the hope that I will get a straight answer. The National Guard Association of the United States uh, uh, wrote me a letter signed by Richard Alexander, Major General Retired, thanking me for introducing H.R. 1345. I will just read a paragraph from this. Thousands of guardsmen and women are currently being called to active duty in support of the ongoing operations in Iraq, supporting the global war on terrorism, defense of the homeland, in addition to the multitude of other state and federal operational missions normally performed. Many members of the National Guard are experiencing financial hardships when they serve their country for extended periods periods of time due to the difference of income between their civilian and military pay. H.R. 1345, which is my legislation, will help mitigate financial loss by making up the difference between a guardsman's civilian and military salaries. Now, Mr. Hall, since you have been the most articulate and vociferous opponent of my legislation, let me ask you to explain something to me which Despite my best efforts, I'm incapable of comprehending it. You and your superiors, all the way up to Secretary Rumsfeld, are full of praise for private companies when they do exactly what my legislation calls for by the federal government. I have a whole list of quotations from a very large number of important people like yourself showering praise on private companies for doing exactly what my legislation calls for. Yet, incomprehensibly and illogically, you are vehemently opposed to a legislation which is totally nonpartisan in character, and it will help enormously in recruitment, retention, morale, in every conceivable arena that you, as a responsible officer, are interested in. Now, please explain to me, how can you praise a private company for voluntarily introducing the precise provision my legislation mandates the federal government to do? I will try to be as careful in answering your question as you posed it to me. And I didn't realize I was uh, the most vociferous opponent of, you are, sir. of yours. I didn't know I had that label. Uh, what I try to do is to look upon uh, this issue in a very broad aspect. First of all, I think it's appropriate that we praise those civilian employers who do this. They do not have active duty people in the same foxhole with our Guard and Reserve that they have to worry about. All of the Reserve Chiefs, as Mr. McHugh have said, have come over and have worried about the comparability of an active duty E4 in a foxhole with a Reserve E4, and do they receive the same federal pay, and, and they do. And I spent, as I said, 34 years of my life in uniform commanding young men and women on the active duty side. And we have to honestly worry about that in the federal government. Now, may I stop you for a second? Yes, sir. Your logic has already left you, because you are applauding the private employer who pays a salary which makes two people in the same foxhole getting different salaries. So you can't have it both ways. You can't praise private employers for doing exactly what my legislation calls for. I mean, with a straight face, you can't tell me this because it makes no sense. Well, uh, I, I do applaud them, and they have their own imperatives and their own system, and they have chosen to do that. And uh, Well, I also why don't you answer my question? You have two people in the same foxhole getting different salaries because General Electric chooses to maintain the salary while the person is on active duty. And you are praising General Electric for creating presumably a problem for you. I have answered it in that the federal pay for that active duty and that reserve soldier needs to be the same, and it is the same, and that is my lane to worry about. And remember, one-third of our Guardsmen and Reservists lose some amount of pay. Two-thirds have the same amount or more. And the average loss 
And I know we focus on what is in the newspaper of tremendous bankruptcies, tremendous loss. That is not the case. It's between three and $4,000. Now, that, that's an amount of money. We worry about that. But it is not where each and every one of these soldiers are losing their homes and going bankrupt. We worry about that. There are possible solutions such as insurance, but we need to worry about targeting the full range of compensation to those young men and women. And, and uh, uh, the Guard and Reserve Chiefs all together and the active duty chiefs have stated uh, their position that in considering the overall compensation, and I also do not believe this is the major recruiting and retention problem we have this particular pay. There are others that if we have limited funds, we need to look at. And I, I think I've answered it uh, uh, the way I honestly feel based on my background service and my position now. Well, let, let me just pursue it a bit. Well, your time's up. You, if you'll allow me, Mr. Chairman. Uh, how much? I'll be asking unanimous consent. You can ask unanimous consent to increase your time. I do. Is there any objection to giving the gentleman a couple, two additional minutes without objection? The notion that the current situation hurts only one-third of the people who are serving our country, and that can be dismissed so cavalierly, is absolutely preposterous. We are passing legislation here that, that help 1% of our population. We are, you're talking about one-third of your manpower or of person power, which is being hurt by this idiotic policy. It's an idiotic policy, and I'm using the term advisedly. And for you to dismiss it, that it impacts only one-third of the people, you need to give me an answer, for you don't give a damn about that one-third? I uh, don't dismiss it cavalierly. I've told you how serious I view uh, the compensation for our young men and women. Uh, and we look at it in a broad view. I understand yours, and, and I think I've answered it uh, adequately about my concern for our young men and women. Well, let me for the record state, I think your answer totally lacks logic and internal consistency and is totally unacceptable. Yes, sir, I appreciate that. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. A gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Schrock. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Congressman, Admiral, General, General, thank you for being here today on what is a very difficult subject but a very important one. I think that as a nation we are probably at a crossroads where we must make a choice on what the role of the National Guard is going to be. That choice should be made in the context of the full spectrum of tasks that we expect of the men and women who serve this country in uniform. I've been to both Iraq and to Afghanistan, and I have always returned home and remarked how it was impossible to tell the difference between the reservists, the guardmen, and the, uh, the guard, and the active duty uh, forces. They look the same, and they face the same threat. But as leaders charged with funding these troops, with equipping them, with training them, and with answering to them and their families, when we ask them to go into harm's way, we must not fool ourselves that they are the same. The Marines fighting outside of, of uh, Fallujah and the Jaff right now knew from day one that they were being trained and equipped to someday go in harm's way for this country. They represent the finest combat force that this, uh, this country has ever produced. Before they went to Iraq, they were specifically trained and equipped for urban combat. They share a warrior mindset that comes from walking out the door each day in uniform and training for war. Unfortunately, we, do not always, we are not always able to give our guardsmen that same level of training before we have asked them to deploy to Iraq and other places around the world. They do not receive that training day in and day out. If they receive the same equipment and training, they receive it at the last minute and often with hand-me-down equipment previously used by the active component. Their families do not see them walk out of the house each day in uniform and become accustomed to their prolonged absences and the chance that they may someday have to serve in environments such as Iraq. As a nation, we must decide what the role the National Guard will be in meeting both our global military commitments and our homeland security needs. I believe that our National Guard is rightfully part of our first responder equation. If we are going to continue to rely on the Guard to, comp to comprise 40 percent of our nation's military capability, we have to come to grips with our responsibility to train them, to equip them, and to let them know that they are part of the team. We must ensure that Funding levels and that of the authorities and scope of Title 10 and Title 32 reflect the way that our world has changed in the last three years. We must reevaluate our own commitment as leaders responsible for this crucial homeland security force and critical military 
uh, reserve force. That being said, I want to address several questions to, to you, Secretary McHale, if I might, and I hope the chair will indulge me because some of it is rather long. The Guard differs from the reserve components in that it is under the command and control of the states. This, posi this positions the Guard for some unique opportunities at the state-federal nexus. The question, does DOD see the National Guard's unique Title 32 activities, such as civil support teams, the counter-drug programs, or the air airport security missions to be unhelpful distractions? Or have these uses of Title 32 been meaningful contributors to the security of the nation? Congressman Schrock, let me emphasize in the strongest possible terms that Title 32 has been a, of enormous benefit not only to the Department of Defense but to the nation. There are three categories in which the Guard may be employed. In state status, where at state expense under command and control of the Governor, the Guard executes the missions that are assigned to it by the Governor. At the other end of the spectrum, you've got Title 10, where the National Guard is brought to federal service, paid for at federal expense and under command and control of the President of the United States and the Secretary of Defense. Title 32 is an excellent, very flexible middle ground which produces tremendous utility. The expense of Title 32 is paid for by the Department of Defense, by the Federal Government, but in Title 32 status, National Guardsmen are exempt from posse comitatus, so they can engage in missions that are very close to law enforcement activities, missions that would be precluded for Title 10 forces. Uh, the expense, as I said, is carried by the Federal Government, but we have flexibility in terms of command and control by the Governor. If anything, where we are at at this point is the Department of Defense is actively reviewing the tremendous benefit of Title 32 to determine whether or not that training status needs to be expanded in the context of the global war on terrorism for an increased number of missions in that Title 32 status because it has proven to be so beneficial. Okay. Then I'm going to go to the last question because you talked about Title 30. How soon might we expect the DOD to send to Congress a proposal to revise Title 32, in particular the language about training that is in Section uh, 502F, I think it is. As you point out, Title 32 status involves National Guardsmen who are on active duty performing specific missions that often have been statutorily assigned. We have 32 civil support teams. We will have 12 more this year and, and presumably 11 more after that uh, based upon the, the assumption that the Congress will provide the funding for the final 11. In Title 32 status, uh, we have those forces immediately available at Federal expense, exempt from posse comitatus, under command and control by the Governor. I mentioned earlier in response to Congresswoman Norton that we are preparing a comprehensive, really I think a historic, homeland defense strategy that will be completed by June 30, 2004. I don't want to assume that we will necessarily ask for a statutory revision of Title 32, but by the end of June we will know whether or not such a revision would be appropriate. And frankly, because Title 32 is a training status, right. in the context of the global war on terrorism, we need to take a very serious look at expanding Title 32 to cover additional operational missions. So sometime around... I would think by the middle of summer, middle if in summer. fact... If, in fact, we request a change in Title 32, mm -hmm. we would know by the middle of summer whether such a change would be required. I don't want to preclude an ongoing review, but certainly at this point, it, it, it appears to me as if Title 32 would be appropriate for review to include in the future not only training missions, but operational missions, and specifically the mission that I envision as being central to the, the future of, of the National Guard and Homeland Defense missions, and that is critical infrastructure protection. Right. The use of National Guard potentially in Title 32 to defend critical infrastructure in an operational role within our own country. Okay. Mr. Chairman, do you mind if I continue for a minute? Can't give the gentleman two additional minutes. Thank you. Uh, Paul, the, uh, this question is about the possibility uh, of similar operations in the future. The airport security mission was performed under Title 32. The Federal Government provided the money. The States executed the mission. This seems uh, to have been a success, but subsequently there was a need to use the Guard for border security, and of course for that mission the Guard was taken out of the State control under Title 32 and mobilized to Federal duty under Title 10. Does this reflect an intent by DOD to tend toward f federal mobilization as the best way to use the Guard for domestic requirements, or might such future requirements be uh, evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis for execution under Title 32 or Title 10, as the situation would demand at the time? 
The Secretary of Defense has in the past indicated a preference for the use, use of National Guard forces, including in Title 32 status, rather than the necessary use, uh, because of the lack of an alternative, of Title 10 forces for the same missions. In short, if there is a clear mission requirement and we have the choice between using Title X forces or National Guard forces, particularly for those missions that are related to counter-narcotics right. and the support that we provide to civilian law enforcement along the borders, the preferred course of action is to use the National Guard while preserving our Title X capabilities for overseas war fighting. And that's why, as we look at the emerging mission requirements in the context of the global war on terrorism, there will be more, not less, for the Guard to right. do including mission assignments in Title 32 status. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know my time is up. I'd like to submit two other questions to Secretary McHale for the, for the record. Be happy. Keep thank the record you, open Shirley. for that. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Rupesberger. Sure. Well, you all have a very difficult job, and I think that uh, you've done a great job, but we can always do better, and that's what we're talking about here today. Um, whenever some, whenever, in this country, when there's some, people feel that something is wrong, it's an issue. And as members of Congress, that's why I think you're getting a lot of the questioning on you know, the, the, how long someone's going to be uh, in, in Iraq or Afghanistan or whatever. Uh, what, what I would like to really discuss right now is the short term. The, uh, and General Blum, you said, and I think so far from what I see, I think your plan, the full spectrum force, looks pretty good to me. And, uh, but you said it will be about 24 months, I believe, before it's really implemented. Um, and eventually this plan will reduce the burden on, on those already deployed and, and it will also give some sense of a, of a plan and a commitment on how long they're going to be. I think one of the worst things you can do for anybody is raise expectations and then take those expectations away. But if we're in a war, we have to do what we have to do. And that's what's happening now. Could you please tell us uh, what you need now? I mean, Congress is in session now for the, until probably next November or December, whatever. Um, what would you like to see on the short term to help the troops on the ground and, and their families and their employers? What do we need? And, and really what we're talking about is resources, which means money, which means we have to encourage the administration to maybe reprioritize to do something on the short term. I'd like to hear the short term uh, solutions based on what you've seen now as far as deployment, as far as dealing with families, all of those issues that, that might help. Well, the first thing I'd like to tell you, uh, Congressman Ruppersberger, is the continued, strong, solid, unswerving support for the citizen soldiers and airmen, the young men and women in uniform, separating differences from uh, what is going on and how it's being prosecuted, and if you like the way it's being done or the techniques that, it's, that are being applied, separating that from the solid support to the uniformed service members that are answering the call to colors. I'd like the Congress to continue that strong, solid support. Uh, it is very, very critical in an all-volunteer, all-recruited force that a strong message of support from both parties, from both houses, from all elected officials, uh, be clearly understood that uh, service to our nation is something that is honorable, that is necessary, and is something that uh, should be um, very, very, we all should be very, very proud of and supportive of. So that is the first thing that I would ask the Congress to be very careful in their discussions and deliberations to consider the eroding effect that it has on, on the morale of soldiers that are deployed longer than they would like to be away from their families longer than they would choose to be and uh, putting their career and education and lives, frankly, at risk. In that regard, uh, when I was in, in Iraq, I had a conversation with a member of the Maryland National Guard, and he said, you know, with all this, that political rhetoric we hear, people back home aren't mad at us, are they? And that's an important, that's That's precisely the question that I don't want to have right. in their minds when they're walking but the streets of I want to get to specifics so that we can help Well, the specifics about are, uh, money and resources. If I, if I could, I, I could get the specifics for you, and I'll be glad to leave them for you for the record, because in the interest of time, it would probably be the better way to do it. I'll provide you that. But if you'll put up that chart uh, that talks about the strategic reserve moving to an operational f force, everything on the left side of this chart that, that's about to go up there in, in the uh, – that is listed under a strategic reserve is what is wrong with the National Guard and the reserve components today. They were resourced wrong for today. They were resourced exactly right for 
the time before September 11th, but how, they're not right for today. Resources to me is more Resourcing money. means money for training. And do you have a money figure based on I, I will, that? I'll provide that okay. for you, sir, for the record. And uh, it, it's money for training soldiers to reclassify them from what they are now to what they need to be, to retrain them for the skill sets we need for tomorrow, not what we needed for yesterday. It is money for equipment that we do not have. We were never equipped to be an operational force, so we're always cross-leveling. Each time you cross-level, you lessen what's left in the pot, and cross-leveling becomes more and more difficult. <clears throat> and then the last thing we need is, and most importantly, is we need full-time manning because it is clearly a readiness issue. Right. And, it, and if you're going to use the Guard and Reserve as an operational force, you must have the right a combination of full-time soldiers matching up with part-time soldiers. Okay. And, and that is clearly out of balance today and it needs addressing. Mr. Chairman, may I have one more minute? Without objection. Very objection. quickly, there's a, an article in the some paper today, and I'm sure throughout the country, about re U.S. reservists accused of prisoner abuse. And in I'm quoting in the, in the some paper article written by uh, Tom Bowman and Sabar, um, and this is one of the individuals who's been charged or been the allegations that, that they were abusing prisoners. And by the way, if there's criminal conduct, we have to deal with it like we deal with anything else, and, it can, and we cannot tolerate it. However, there are a lot of gray areas when you're at war. And this, this one of these individuals uh, said that he, we had no support, no training whatsoever. Uh, they were in, in, a, in a prison camp. And, I'll, and I kept asking my chain of command for certain things like rules and regulations. Um, another, another individual said, I understand the, they, they usually don't allow others to watch them interrogate, had to be about interrogation, but we had no rules, no, no, uh, no, no training. Uh, great, uh, the attorney for one of the individuals, uh, told 60 Minutes 2 that the soldiers never had been charged, uh, because of the failure of the commanders to provide proper training and standards. Um, what I'm getting to really is that you have m men and women in the National Guard who are being put in the same situation in the career. We know that. And if they don't have the proper command structure and, and, and then they don't have the training and they're, they're in a situation where they, they might believe that they're at war and they're attempting to do what they need to do, um, I'd like you to address the issue as it relates to what you know uh, as it relates to these men and women and whether or not the, and not specifically, because you can't talk about it, it's a trial, but about that type of training when you're put in that situation, when all of a sudden you know, you're, you're back at home and, and you're, you're, you're doing your weekend duty and then all of a sudden you find yourself uh, in a prison and now, now you have six, six uh, individuals who are being charged that are saying they didn't know what to do, they didn't have the proper training. Um, I, I will not address that specific incident because it's under investigation. And, I and the My fact issue that it, is the issue of but the I will training. talk. I will talk on a broad issue there, and and I and I believe what I'm about to tell you to the core of my being. We have never, as a nation, sent a force of soldiers overseas better trained, better prepared, better equipped, better led with better values and clearly established standards than we have sent these soldiers that are over there right now. And I believe that deep in my heart, to the core of my being. I've gone and watched this training. I've participated in training. I've been the product of the training. I have visited every single major unit that has been prepared before it was sent to Iraq and Afghanistan. And I have visited those same units in theater once they're there. And I, and I stand on the record of that. Now, will you find uh, some soldier uh, who may not live up to the standards and the training that they receive? That's possible. And that may be happening or may not be happening in this case, and that's why it's well, being investigated. In, in this case and other cases, we have to evaluate to make sure that it's not training and that it is actually criminal conduct. But I think it's important when we, when we – there are a lot of gray areas and we're at war. It's very, very important that we deal with the issue of training. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Mr. Shays. Thank you. I want to uh, first say I have tremendous admiration for all of you, and all of you have very excellent reputations. And I would say to my colleague, Mr. McHale, that I considered him one of the finest members of Congress 
to serve as I've served here, and I think it's a real blessing that you're working for the administration uh, and for our country. I, um, uh, when I was last in Iraq, and this was my fifth visit with my staff, uh, I recently, in my capacity as chairman of the National Security Subcommittee, which oversees Defense and State Department, um, I recently, I visited Bravo Company, first uh, of the 252nd Armored Brigade, commanded by Captain Sean Moser. This North Carolina uh, National Guard unit is helping secure the city of Honigan in northeast Iraq. I, I just want to say uh, for the record that these soldiers at B Company are doing a superb job. But having said that, I want to say to you that the military has never made it easy for us to go and visit Iraq. And when we go, we learn things. And I believe that Congress has not done the proper oversight job. If you had ever told me that we would send troops without proper body ar armament, I would have been amazed, but we did, General. Uh, if you had told me we would have sent them in Humvees that didn't have proper protection, I would have been amazed, but we did. Because in that company, we saw one uh, Humvee modified by a kit, one modified by the soldiers in country, and one not even modified. And then we had the basic briefing that there were catches of weapons throughout uh, the eastern part of Iraq, pre-deployed. They are constantly uncovering them. Then we had a three-hour briefing in Baghdad showing how, us how they make these weapons. And I just want to say to you as well, um, General Blum, I know these are the best trained military, but I also know firsthand, and in the soul of my being, just as you would say, uh, I had uh, Army personnel tell us that they were being asked to do things they were never, ever trained for. And that's a fact. And it didn't happen once, it didn't happen twice, it happened continually. And for me, I didn't even know about the inadequacy of our Humvees until I had a community meeting in Oxford, Connecticut, and I had two moms show me letters from their National Guard sons showing us the Humvees that were not in any way with a kit or improvision, improvised or not. So I just want to put that on the record. We're doing the best we can do, but it is a surprise to me that when I sent our men and women off to war, I sent them, in some cases, without the best equipment. And I believe it's the National Guard and reservists who are the last in the food chain. And I would like to think that in the future, it will never happen again. And I know you make the best of what you can do. Uh, but for me, I thought my job was to make sure it was never a fair fight. And I think that in some cases, I've put our men and women in jeopardy. Uh, and I think we have to just say it and then deal with it. Uh, not to mention the pay problems and the benefit problems and the health care problems that exist for our reservists and National Guard. I. Um, I want to understand, uh, so not, I, I, and the other thing I want to say, and I'm sorry the preface is so long, but having visited bases all throughout the country in previous years, I praise God I did, because you all told us the people you have to get to sign up is not the soldier, it's the spouse of the soldier. And if we talk about having them be gone every four or five years, uh, I am going to be very surprised uh, if we aren't going to lose a lot of good men and women. And, and not to mention our soldiers being forced to take anthrax against their will, not re-enlisting, which affects the Air Force, um, General Love. So um, having said that, tell me why it isn't harder to be a National Guard and reservist, given that you've got to be trained to fight and hopefully do your job extraordinarily well and defend yourself and make sure you come home to your loved ones. Tell me why this isn't a harder job than the active forces because you also have to be trained to do work under Title 32 for the states. I think it is a tougher job than the active forces. Tell me it's no different or tell me in fact is it harder? It's harder, sir. Okay. It's been harder for 367 years. It well, hasn't gotten any easier. Nobody said it was going to be easy. Nobody said it was going to be we, fair. We've made it harder, though. We, if you, that chart tells the story. 
It is not because of anybody's evil intent. No, most of the policies, most of the laws that have caused the pay problems, the lack of health care, the lack of properly equipping the United States Army and Air National Guard, properly resourcing them of full-time manning and enough money to train and operate. Excuse me. Could, I, could I see an MSN just to have two more minutes, Mr. Chairman? That obje any objection without objection? Thank you. I'm sorry. Continue. Absolutely. All of those things are true, but they are not by accident. They're by design. We were supposed to be a strategic reserve. We did a superb job as a strategic reserve. We were a great deterrent force against the Russians in the Warsaw Pact. That's no longer our threat. We now need to be an operational force, right. and you need, sir, Congress needs to reevaluate the benefits, the entitlements, the pay, the, the, right. the resourcing, the equipping, and the full-time manning Let issues of the Army and Air Guard, or we can't be an operational force the well, way but, you would like it to be. But to say that they've always had a harder job, I think, I think it is many-fold harder today because of September 11th and the responsibilities they have to train for a terrorist attacks which we weren't really focused on in the past. Vice Chairman Shays, we're in violent agreement. I agree okay. with you. Okay. It's but a tough job, but it's, it's, it's an essential I, and I, necessary job if we're going to defend this nation. I'm not going to argue that, but, but a few years ago we also decided they're going to be part of the force structure in a very primary way. And all, you know, I, I feel like, in a way, this is a debate we did not have before we sent them to Iraq. And I have a bit of concern that um, it has not turned out quite the way we had hoped. That, that I, may... I just want to make my point, and I want to ask uh, uh, Major General Love for you to respond as well. But before he does, I just want to finish my point, if I might. Okay. This, I personally and professionally feel, and I, I'm, I'm under oath, and I have an obligation when asked by the Congress to tell how I really feel about this, and I would like to do that. I personally and professionally feel this nation should never go to war without the National Guard. When you call up the National Guard, you call up America, and we should never, ever send a force overseas that Congress yeah, or this nation can walk left. away from. I, I, I hear what you're saying, and I'm not disagreeing with it, but what I'm saying is they were the last in the food chain. No, I know no. that for a fact, and, and yet they're being asked to do a harder job, in my judgment, than the Act of Force. I just would love you, Mr. But, Lieutenant General. But, but there is, for Excuse the record, sir, they are not last in the food chain. The 30th, the 39th, the 81st that have just gone to Iraq were first in the food chain. They got body armor before the active army. They've got up armored Humvees before the active General, army. I'm going to say this as clearly as I can. Uh, I know this for a fact. When we, when we, the hand-me-downs of aircraft and so on, they usually get some equipment that has true. already been used by the active forces, that's and, and that's a fact that's that you and I know is true. General, and then I need uh, to Congressman, you. thank you. And, and as a preface, if I may, I uh, would uh, say that I was invited here today to to speak on behalf of NORTHCOM, and so, uh, if I may, I will answer your question from personal experience rather than in my role as, as uh, the uh, assistant commander of NORTHCOM, and, and uh, I think a review of, of my personal experience in the Air National Guard would indicate that the Air National Guard was asked to become an operational reserve immediately following the first Gulf War. And it had the period of the 90s in which to bring itself up to the status of a participant, an equal participant, in the, the Air Expeditionary Forces. Uh, yes, there were some equipment shortfalls, and yes, there may not have been the most modern current equipment within the Air National Guard, but whether it was in the transportation business or in the uh, fighter business, uh, I'm proud to say that uh, the Air National Guard uh, carried its role and, and the Congress supported it uh, when it asked for support uh, to, to assist us in doing so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The men and women in the National Guard and the Reserves are doing an awesome job, and I thank them for that. Thank you. Uh, I've just got a couple questions. General Blum, nobody's really asked today what we can do from our, from here in Congress to help the Guard carry out its missions. Are there any legislation or authorizations that would be helpful? along the, the vision that you have uh, given us? 
Well, uh, based on most of the comment that has uh, gone on here today and uh, Governor Pataki's earlier comment, uh, unambiguous, uh, clear legislative authority for the operational use of Title 32 I think would be highly helpful for both the Department of Defense and the National Guard so that we can uh, know how we're going to respond to the governors and to the president in, in the uh, myriad conditions that we're asked to respond. Uh, right now, the ambiguity of uh, the current uh, code leaves it much too subject to interpretation, and, and, and it is built, actually, that code was built again for a strategic force, not an operational force to be in being uh, in a global, combating a global war on terrorism. So, sir, I would say that would be first and foremost. Uh, thank you. General Love, let me just ask, uh, I know that NORTHCOM just conducted two very large-scale annual training exercises called the Unified Defense uh, that included scenarios for protecting the homeland under simultaneous attacks. Can you tell us a little about the exercise, uh, who participated, and, and any uh, lessons we learned? Um, you're right, sir. We, uh, it was unified defense. Uh, it, the uh, exercises perhaps you're referring to were Determined Promise 03, which occurred last August, and Unified Defense 04. Um, and, and yes, sir, you're correct as well in saying that we uh, engaged our forces in multiple places uh, responding, to, as Secretary McHale pointed out earlier today, to the anticipated uh, attack on this country and, and by, uh, by our enemies in, in a number of places at the same time. Uh, the lessons we learned from that uh, were, were very good and sometimes very painful, uh, and that is that, that we did not have the command and control that we perhaps needed. Uh, we didn't have the exercising that we perhaps needed. But that is examined in the light of the fact that we wouldn't exercise if we didn't want to learn those lessons. And NORTHCOM is uh, just barely, not quite 18 months old. And uh, uh, is, is that responsive, sir? It's fine. Let me just thank this panel. There's always a tendency in the military and politics and everything else to fight the last war. And nobody does the last war better than we did. If you look at the conventional war we raised, that we uh, did in Iraq. No, nobody does it better. You drive through Baghdad and there are heaps of rubble that were military installations, defense installations, and next door residential buildings that weren't touched. Uh, but it's the aftermath that obviously we weren't prepared for. Uh, no one had envisioned this. Uh, General Blum, I'm glad to see your vision now is looking at these kind of things. Uh, we continue to need to look outside the box because it may be a little more complicated that in, in our next uh, uh, area of operations, and who knows? Uh, we just need to continue to have these conversations with us and the other appropriate committees. Uh, this this hearing has been very helpful uh, to all of us. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time. Paul, it's just great to have you back here on the, on the other side. Uh, have a lot of confidence in you and a lot of respect from your days in the House. Anything else anyone wants to add? Mr. Chairman, might I have about 30 seconds? Yes, because you may. the question you asked General Blum about things that you might do, sure. uh, we have a number of rules which don't cost a lot of money, but are rules for our guardsmen and reservists that go back to the Cold War, which uh, does not uh, contribute to a continuum of service. And we've passed those over. We would appreciate you looking at them, such as volunteer auxiliaries. The single biggest source of manpower that we have not tapped are retirees. And I have vast amount of retirees call mm. and ask, can I serve? They're, they're around our bases. We would like authority to form uh, voluntary auxiliaries to use those retired population in the country which can relieve the stress on our Guard and Reserve. <laughs> Many of our rules, which if you serve more than 179 days, we count you on active duty list for promotion, uh, the strength accounting. So there are a number of those rules which I think we need to uh, take care of, which are not costly but will make service easier for our Guardsmen and Reservists. We will so those are submitted and we would ask if they make sense that uh, the committee look at them to Thank support you. them. Have you also uh, submitted those? to Duncan Hunter and his committee. We have, and, and, and we would we'll work uh, with them as well. We think it will help our young men and women and not cost a lot of money. Right. Mr. Well, uh, sure. Uh, if I may, just, uh, just a sure. brief closing comment. I would hope that it was clear in my opening statement and perhaps in some of the answers to the questions raised by the members that during the past two years since September the 11th, we have very substantially reviewed, revised, and strengthened our homeland defense capabilities. And that's not rhetoric. Those are deliverable operational capabilities on a daily basis. We fly air combat, air patrols that were not being flown prior to September the 11th. We have Army and Marine units on alert for deployment within our own country to defend against a ground attack. And most importantly, 
we have and are developing at a higher level the ability to respond to multiple near simultaneous WMD attacks within our own country. We have not had that capability historically. We have it now and it is getting better every day. Thank you very much. And let me associate myself with Mr. Lantos's remarks at the beginning where he said we really appreciate and respect the job you are doing and, of course, the men and women in uniform that you represent. Thank you very much. Take a two-minute recess as we move to our next panel. I'd like to announce the third panel, Janet A. St. Laurent, Director, Defense Capabilities and Management, General Accounting Office, Lieutenant General Wayne D. Marty, State Adjutant General of Texas, Major General Timothy L. Lowenberg, State Adjutant General of Washington, Major General Bruce Tuxel, State Adjutant General of Maryland. Uh, as you know, uh, gentlemen and lady, it is the policy of our committee to swear in all our witnesses, and I would respectfully request you stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. Uh, note for the record that all our witnesses are responding the affirmative, and I appreciate others standing up in case we needed to uh, uh, seek their testimony. Um, we will go in the order I called you. Uh, we do a five-minute clock. We roll it over, but we would like you to stay as close to the five minutes as you can. You also know that your testimony will be part of the record. And you also feel free to, to respond to any question that was asked um, and, uh, in the previous two panels. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your testimony. And thank you for your service to our country and to your states. Uh, Ms. St. Laurent. Your mic is not on. I should have warned you. And pull it a little closer, if you would, please. Tap it. No, I mean, tap the mic and we'll tell you if it's on. You're on. Yes, thank you. Okay. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I am pleased to be here today to discuss GAO's observations on challenges facing the National Guard. For the sake of time, I would like to quickly summarize our work in three areas. First, how and to what extent Guard forces have been used since September 11th. Second, how the use of the Guard has affected readiness for future operations. And third, challenges that DOD, Congress, and the States face in preparing the National Guard for the future. First, let me turn to the use of the Guard. Since September 11th, over 51 percent of Army Guard personnel and 31 percent of Air Guard personnel have been activated or alerted for a wide range of Federal missions at home and abroad. The chart on the board to your left, and I believe you also have copies of these, show that the Army Guard has experienced the largest demand for forces. As of last month, the Army Guard had almost 95,000 soldiers, more than 25 percent of its forces, mobilized or on alert to support operations in Iraq, Afghanistan, and at home. Moreover, DOD has recently placed thousands of additional soldiers on alert. The Air Guard's usage has also been significant, but has declined in recent months. Currently, the Air Guard has about 7,500 personnel who are deployed overseas or conducting homeland security missions at home, such as flying combat air patrols over portions of the nation. Second, I would like to turn to readiness. Specifically, the readiness of Guard non-deployed units has declined steadily since September 11th. Declining readiness is a more serious problem for the Army Guard because it has not been funded to quickly deploy the number and types of units that have been needed within the past few years. In the past, much of the Army Guard's role was to be a strategic reserve force that would be maintained at lower readiness levels and given additional resources and time to train if needed in the event of war. 
Although real world demands on the Army Guard have changed, DOD's resourcing strategy has not. For example, the Army Guard's eight divisions are authorized 65% of the personnel they need, while the Guard's 15 enhanced brigades, which are intended to be maintained at a higher readiness level, are authorized about 85% of personnel. However, theater commanders require that units deploy with 100% of required personnel, and that has been the case for Iraq. As a result, the Army Guard has had to transfer significant numbers of personnel and equipment from non-deploying to deploying units. For example, the Army Guard has had to initiate transfers of 71,000 soldiers since September 11th. To get two enhanced brigades ready to deploy to Iraq earlier this year, the Army Guard had to transfer about 2,000 soldiers, about a quarter of the total required for these brigades, um, worsening shortfalls elsewhere. The readiness problem also affects equipment. To mobilize forces to Iraq, the Guard transferred about 22,000 pieces of equipment, such as night vision goggles, machine guns, trucks, and radios. This is an important point because it further degrades the readiness of some units that may be needed in the near future. Moreover, some of this equipment is the same type of equipment that may be needed to deter or respond to potential terrorist threats at home. In addition, the Army and Air Guard's readiness for homeland security missions is uncertain because DOD has not fully established requirements or readiness measures for these missions. Officials in most states we visited were somewhat concerned that ongoing Guard deployments may lead to situations in which Guard units are not available when needed at home. I would like to refer you to two charts that provide a snapshot of Army and Air National Guard personnel deployed in March of 2004. The first chart, which refers to the Army National Guard, shows that 15 states had 40% or more of Army Guard soldiers alerted or activated in March and therefore unavailable to the governor. A couple of states had over 60% deployed. The next chart shows that the Air Guard was less affected by high deployments. Only a few states had more than 20% of their Air Guard personnel deployed during March. Finally, Mr. Chairman, we see three major challenges that DOD, Congress, and the states will need to collectively address. First, DOD's current practice of transferring large numbers of personnel and equipment from non-deploying to deploying Army Guard units, in other words, robbing Peter to pay Paul, will not be sustainable if the high pace of operations continues. Although DOD is aware of this issue, it has not uh, developed any comprehensive formal plan or identified specific funds to address it. Second, although the Army National Guard plans to restructure its forces for the long term and would like to meet a greater percent of its full-time manning requirements in the future, DOD has not yet fully budgeted for these initiatives or developed detailed implementation plans. Finally, the Guard has taken some steps to identify the types of capabilities that each state should have for homeland security, such as aviation, transportation, engineer, security units and to develop a rotation scheme that will try to keep 50% of the forces in each state at home. However, details have not yet been developed and coordination with the states will be required to implement the plan. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, declining readiness combined with the continuing high pace of operations suggests that a comprehensive reassessment of the Army Guard's structure and resourcing assumptions is needed. Moreover, once Homeland Security requirements are better defined, Additional analysis will be needed to assess the impact on both the Army and Air National Guard. This concludes my statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Appreciate your testimony. And uh, General Marty, uh, welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Let me just say that it's an honor for this Texas soldier to come before this honored committee to testify. Thank you very much. General, you need to know it is an honor to have you come before us. Don't even wonder. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to discuss the transformation of the Texas military forces. The Texas military forces include the Adjutant General's Department, the Texas National Guard, both the Army and the Air, and the Texas State Guard. We are a diverse team of approximately 21,000 federal 
and state personnel in 106 installations in or near 86 cities and towns across Texas. Since September the 11th, the Texas military forces have responded to homeland security requirements and other public emergencies in a variety of ways that demonstrate the versatility of the force. These include the fighter escort of Air Force One immediately following the 9-11 attacks, the security of 26 airports statewide, assisting the FBI in review of airline manifest, augmenting immigration and nationalization service, the Border Patrol, the Customs Service along the Mexican border and Gulf Coastline, conducting combat air patrols over Houston, the Gulf Coast, New York City, and Washington. Frequent interception missions against unidentified aircraft entering U.S. airspace and security of critical national assets at at least 20 locations across the United States. Additional activities include augmenting search, security, and rescue forces at the World Trade Center and the 2002 Winter Olympics in Utah, both air and ground support of local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies along the Mexican border and throughout the state assisting with the joint recovery of the Space Shuttle Columbia, medical and dental support to the needy in South Texas border region, and emergency response to hurricanes, tropical storms, tornadoes, snowstorms, floods, and wildfires. Our ability to respond like this is based upon close working relationships with state homeland security and emergency management officials and clear guidance from them on their requirements. The shuttle recovery operation in particular highlighted the value of Title 32 mobilizations, which provided federal funds but allowed the governor and me to continue to use the established system of command and control in the habit and the habitual relationships with the state emergency agencies and responders. In addition, since September the 11th, Texas military forces have developed on land have deployed on land, at sea, and in the air in support of the global war on terrorism at 195 locations within the United States, on, coastal, uh, on coalition naval vessels in the Mediterranean, and in 38 countries. I must tell you that we could not have done this without the support of the United States Congress and the American people. For that, we are very grateful. Our ability to meet the demands of these expanding roles is also greatly facilitated by the drive for the joint transformation by the Department of Defense and the National Guard Bureau. In Texas, we are pursuing transformation along five distinct but closely related lines. We have transformed the various headquarters into a single joint state headquarters. We are transforming the Texas Army National Guard into agile, versatile, modular, independent units of action. We are transforming the Air National Guard into a more relevant force anchored in precision strike, fighter training, and worldwide tactical airlift. We are transforming the Texas State Guard, a voluntary auxiliary to the Texas National Guard, and to a joint forces specialist to augment the medical infrastructure in Texas in public health emergencies, including terrorism. We continue sir, to serve both the global war on terrorism and homeland missions. As should be apparent, the preparation for one role has enhanced our preparation for the other because both missions require agility and the ability by diverse agencies and services to work closely together and effectively. You've asked how you could help. And let me through maybe have some suggestions. To continually fully support the Department of Defense and U.S. government's drive for joint transformation. To assist the Department of Defense in adjusting incentive programs. Retention incentives can be redirected from military, military occupational specialist bonuses to post-mobilization retention bonuses. To assist the Department of Defense in ensuring that our soldiers and airmen have the equipment they need, including ammunition for training, aircraft upgrades, and engineer equipment. Assist the Department of Defense in making various funding streams, which begin with Congress, less stovepipe, and more flexible, and more joint. I'd like to thank you very much for having me here, 
and I appreciate your efforts on behalf of the National Guard soldiers and airmen, their families and their employers, as well as the soldiers, the sailors, and airmen, Marine, members of the Coast Guard personnel who serve this great nation. These are great young men and women, and I am extremely proud of them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We are extremely grateful for your work and proud of the men and women who you work with, General. And uh, let me uh, introduce uh, and um, recognize uh, General Lowenberg and just say, General, um, uh, my staff has uh, wanted me to just know, uh, so I want uh, to put it on the record that your statement, which is 73 p plus pages, um, my staff, uh, excuse me, the chairman's staff's view as almost a Bible of what should be done uh, and are very grateful for your very significant uh, effort to try to accommodate this committee and its work. Uh, we're grateful as well that you will summarize your statement. Um, but but I, 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 I want very much to put on the record that your entire statement is going to be very helpful to this committee. And uh, we may not plagiarize, but we'll come close. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for those kind words, members of the committee. It's an honor to be with you today in my capacity as the Adjutant General for the State of Washington and as Chair of Homeland Security for the Adjutant General's Association of the United States. Like the Adjutant General of all states, I have military and civilian responsibilities that are unique among all the military services and, for that matter, unique throughout the remainder of state and federal government. In addition to my Joint Army and Air National Guard command responsibilities, I'm the state's senior emergency management official. I'm charged with administering the comprehensive emergency management plan for the state of Washington. I oversee our statewide enhanced 911 telecommunication system. I serve on the state interoperability executive committee. I serve as the state's Homeland Security Advisor, and in that respect, for every week since the attack of September 11, 2001, I have chaired a weekly meeting of the Governor's Chief of Staff, his senior cabinet officials and policy advisors, and the state attorney general. As the state cabinet level official for Homeland Security, I deal directly with my federal counterpart, Secretary Tom Ridge. I also serve as the Homeland Security Grant Administrator for our state, and therefore interstate interface with the senior officials in other federal agencies such as the Department of Defense, uh, Health and Human Services, Energy, and others. I mention these interwoven civil military responsibilities because they are not unique to me. Variations of my own portfolio are reflected in the central roles of General Tuxel and others and other National Guard adjutants general throughout all of the states and territories. We are the fusion point that assures a unity of effort within our states between the states and the federal government, and perhaps most significantly, between the Department of Defense and other federal agencies where the risks and vulnerabilities are the greatest at the state and local level. Just as our responsibilities are unique, so too the military forces that we command have a unique legal status. And it's that unique legal status that is our greatest strength and offers extraordinary flexibility to state and federal authorities in how our forces can be used to enhance homeland security. That status should be leveraged by using the National Guard in Title 32 status to the maximum extent possible for all domestic operations, not just for training, as is currently unambiguously authorized in 32 U.S.C. 502, but also for the fullest scope of domestic operations. The practical, physical, and legal advantages of using the Guard in Title 32 status are well documented in the Defense Science Board summer study, which will soon be released in a resolution adopted by the National Governors Association last year and in my formal testimony. This country needs bold, visionary leaders at the national level to revise Title 32 for the 21st century, to remove bureaucratic obstacles. I encourage the Congress to take strong action to make it unambiguously clear that Title 32 duty may be used for domestic operational missions in addition to training. If properly authorized and resourced to assist civil authorities, in addition to preparing for our overseas combat missions, the Guard can make a wealth of experience and expertise available to federal, state, and local authorities in planning, training, and exercising for synchronized, complex emergency responses. Our experience in intelligence fusion and analysis can and should be made available to state and local authorities. This integration would contribute greatly to the operation picture needed by NORTHCOM. As has been previously noted, the Guard has provided counter-drug support to state and federal and local law enforcement agencies for more than a decade and a half. The nexus between drug trafficking and terrorism is clear. 
Congress should expand the existing National Guard counter-drug program to a larger narco-terrorism focus that authorizes and funds a governor's narco-terrorism plan in each state. And just as we do with the current counter-drug program, that narco-terrorism plan should be fully vetted and approved by the Department of Defense. Taking a successful program like the current counter-drug program and updating it to combat the 21st century narco-terrorism threats confronting our nation would be transformational indeed. To effectively rebalance the force in concert with everything General Blum and other witnesses have outlined for you, the Army National Guard must be resourced at a C-1 level of readiness, not at C-3 as it is now. In contrast to the Army, the Air Force has fully resourced the Air National Guard at 100 percent of its validated requirements. We can field an Army National Guard force with an equal state of readiness, but only if the Department of Defense and Army choose to fund the Army National Guard to the same C-1 level as the Air National Guard. These are policy choices with stark operational and national security consequences. DOD has a number of high density, uh, high demand, low density mission areas in, that are currently in short supply. I'll simply recognize that these same capabilities are also desperately needed by the states for domestic homeland security, and as a result, these mission areas should be expanded and resourced as quickly as possible. Secretary McHale's presence here underscores how dramatically the Department of Defense itself has reshaped and reformatted to meet the challenges of the global war on terrorism. The purpose and charter of the National Guard Bureau needs to be similarly updated to give the Chief of the National Guard Bureau clear statutory authority to deal directly with Secretary McHale and with NORTHCOM, with JDOMS, and with all of the other players in this newly reorganized Department of Defense Homeland Security architecture. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, General. And uh, General Tuxel, thank you so much. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the committee. Uh, I'm here representing Maryland's Governor Robert L. Ehrlich, Jr., and mainly he asked me to come to discuss our readiness in the National Guard for our some 8,300 uh, men and women that, combine the, uh, that comprise the National Guard in Maryland. In keeping with the 367-year tradition, Maryland citizen soldiers and airmen continue to respond today. We have over 1,100 soldiers and airmen deployed in support of either Operation Noble Eagle, Operation Enduring Freedom, or Operation Iraqi Freedom. Since 9-11, we've deployed over 4,100 citizen soldiers and airmen in response to the global war on terror. Our soldiers and airmen fully understand that our nation is at war with terror and likewise expect to serve. These young men and women have volunteered to defend this nation against all enemies, foreign and domestic. We owe it to them to ensure they enjoy capable leadership and are provided nothing but the best training and equipment. To do this, the National Guard must be organized, trained, and equipped at the same levels as our active duty counterparts. But the reality is, as a result of our Cold War design to be used as a force in reserve, many units are currently funded at C3 level, thus impacting training and equipment. As a workaround, to provide the combatant commander with National Guard units that are fully equipped to support the war fight, it's become necessary to do what we call cross-leveling. Cross-leveling is gaining personnel and equipment from other units within the state and across state lines. In essence, we are breaking units to provide the appropriate equipment and personnel to the deploying unit. This becomes a vicious circle in that units that gave in many instances do not have the appropriate equipment with which to train. Thus, the losing unit is no longer to even keep a level of C3. Another one of my major concerns continues to be the length and predictability of deployments and how that personnel ops tempo, uh, tempo impacts not only the quality of life, but also the very retention of our soldiers and airmen. Currently, the United States Air Force employs via an Air Expeditionary Force, which provides predictability for their personnel families and their families. If we are to count on the continued support of employers and families in a war that will be conducted over many years, we need to have and provide predictability. I am very supportive of the National Guard Bureau's rotational concept that will give governors 50 percent of their forces available for the state mission and homeland defense 
approximately 25% that are engaged in intensive training preparing to deploy, and 25% of the force employed in operational capability. One more concern that I have is the proper force mix of soldiers and airmen with our active duty counterparts. By that I mean the low density, high demand missions must be addressed. The current efforts underway between the National Guard Bureau and the services are steps in the right direction to correct this imbalance. While I understand the Secretary of Defense's need for a rapid reactive force in the active duty military, we must be able to spread all missions through the active guard and reserve. We cannot be the sole owner of a mission in either the active guard or reserve. To do so, we'll con continue our history of the guard and reserve maintaining legacy missions that will never be mobilized. If we field an operational mission within our active component, we should include the guard and reserve with that fielding wherever practical. I did have a little blurb on Title 32. I will defer to uh, uh, General Lowenberg has a, uh, as a lawyer, I think has a much better description of that, so I will pass that. But I did want to bring out one more thing that uh, I think is very important. The unique infrastructure and population of the state of Maryland and its portion of and proximity to the national capital region presents a very complex set of coordination boundaries for emergency response. We have drafted a memorandum of agreement between the commanding general, DC National Guard, the Adjutant General of Virginia, and myself to ensure mutual aid, support, and cooperation between and among the parties in response to a critical incident or event occurring within the national capital region. This clarifies military command and control of National Guard forces pursuant to the Emergency Management Assistant Con Compact. The Joint Task Force National Capital Region Plan has been approved by the Commander Northcom and the DOD. The Guard is not included in that current document. Subsequent meetings with Northcom, Military District of Washington, and the National Guard Bureau may alter that plan, but the planning that the Adjutant General and the Commanding General of DC are doing right now will not be affected. We see that we are looking at the Guard doing an all-hazards approach to emergency management within the National Capital Region. Finally, in addition to my duties to the Maryland Guard, I have Maryland Emergency Management under my purview. And one of the points that I'd like to make, we had two major incidences, a snowstorm and a uh, Hurricane Isabel last year. Two, two points out of this. The first is that the Guard functioned wonderfully in the state in the state mission. The second is we continued with Operation Noble Eagle, Operation Enduring Freedom, and Ira Operation Iraqi Freedom. And we did that without missing a beat. Once again, thank you for the opportunity to be here, and I, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Before recognizing Mr. Schrock, I just want to thank General Blum and General Love for staying and listening to your testimony. Thank you for wanting to hear their testimony, and thank you for showing them that respect. <clears throat> Mr. Schrock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for, for being here. I have never known anybody who has written a Bible, but this document henceforth and forevermore will be referred to as the Lowenberg Bible. So, and, and I will read it, believe me. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Laurent, for being here at St. Laurent, and thank you for bringing folks from the district I'm privileged to represent as well. And I believe it or not, I read your entire testimony. It took two nights, but I, but I read it, and there's some uh, mighty good things in there. And I want to start the questioning with you, if I could. What do you think of the greatest challenges that the, uh, that the National Guard is going to be facing in the next few years? And do you think the Army has an adequate plan to deal with the eroding readiness that we seem to be experiencing? I would categorize the challenges as being some of a short-term nature and some of a longer-term nature. And um, we are concerned about the effect of these extensive transfers of personnel and equipment from one unit to another uh, to ready-deploying units. And uh, General Bloom mentioned that the Guard soldiers that are deploying to Iraq, after having spent time at the mobilization stations, have gotten additional equipment. They are well trained when they leave there. But I think what we are concerned about is the longer term and cumulative effects yeah. of continuing rotations and having to support Iraq and Afghanistan potentially for a number of years. 
and over time how this will translate into perhaps continuing eroding readiness. Uh, again, we haven't seen the details as to how the Guard might be able to address that situation. Um, haven't seen DOD providing yet funds to address it. But the more we can identify units earlier and give them equipment and personnel that they may need earlier, they will be in a better situation and better trained once they get to mobilization stations. I, I could be wrong, but I'm guessing that I, I'm guessing never in our history have we had to use the Guard and the Reserves to the extent we're using now. Is that right? That's, that's what I, and I think that's why all these right. things are. And another Hitting major right change is that the focus uh, of DOD planning has been on preparing for the combat phase of operations, mm -hmm. and we're now seeing a lot of demands caused by sure. having to do stability operations. Yeah. Uh, adjutants generals of uh, 25 of the states and territories have been vested with dual military force provider civilian emergency management responsibilities. And I understand uh, that you, General Lowenberg, uh, are also the Homeland Security Advisor for the, for the state of Washington. It seems you're all in unique positions to discuss how well the federal government, in other words, the Departments of Defense and Department of Homeland Security are doing in helping your st uh, with your state's homeland defense and, and the homeland security initiatives. What help have you received from uh, DOD and DHS in identifying those requirements? We're working with uh, both of those agencies to identify the requirements as a collaborative effort between the state and federal governments. It's an ongoing process. It's not prescriptive. The Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Defense are not presuming to come to any of the several states and territories and tell us what those requirements are. And we're building those from the ground up. Uh, the National Homeland Security Strategy was intentionally designed to be a collaborative effort, and it's proving to be so. Uh, the relationship the states enjoy with Secretary Ridge and members of his department I would say are, are very healthy. And so right now, uh, we've just formally promulgated our state homeland security strategic plan, which has performance measurables. It has a balanced scorecard matrix for developing the action plans and business plans to affect the enhancement of homeland security preparedness in our state as funds and other resources become available. We're also working with the Department of Defense, with uh, General Everhart and others at Northern Command to identify the communications requirements right. needed to give NORTHCOM and the Department of Homeland uh, Defense a seamless uh, communication site picture so they have a common operating picture. And the development of a joint CONUS coordination support environment is one of the major recommendations of the summer study of the Defense Science Board. I'm very happy to say that that report having been delivered to Secretary Rumsfeld and others in the Department of Defense uh, is undergoing implementation even as we speak, even though the formal vol volume two report of the DSB is still awaiting security review. And so I'm very encouraged by the proactive stance of both of these leading federal agencies. General, you said the, uh, your relation, the relationship with the uh, Department of Homeland Security is healthy. What about DOD? I, I didn't mean to exclude okay. the DOD. Right. Our, our relationship with Northern Command is, is very healthy as well. As chair of Homeland Security for the Adjutant General Association, I serve on Northern Command's General Officer Work Group, as do some of my colleagues. And uh, we are full partners at the table in developing the NORTHCOM uh, Homeland Security requirements. Okay. Let me ask the uh, three generals, what, um, what role do you believe that DHS uh, should play with the Guard's mission in Homeland Protection? I think the Department of Homeland Security should recognize that there are some state security programs uh, taking a holistic approach to it uh, that can best be uh, aided by use of the National Guard. And so this is going to require a very close policy coordination between Secretary McHale and Secretary Ridge to identify those areas that should be funded, perhaps by the Department of Homeland Security, those programs that perhaps should entitle uh, the National Guard to draw Department of Homeland Security funds as a state agency under state active duty, and those programs that should be funded by the Department of Defense itself, utilizing the National Guard in Title 32 status for a paramount federal purpose uh, to develop programs in accordance with federally prescribed task standards and conditions. So again, it's a, a major policy coordination and collaboration effort. General Marty, Texas. In, uh, in Texas, we have an emergency manager and we also have a chairman of the Homeland Security. And then as the adjutant general, I support both of those operations. 
Uh, just recently, we, we've, we've done a change of policy in Texas where uh, I have now the, a member of the Texas National Guard, one of, my member, one of the members from our uh, J3, our operations center, that is now the co-chairman of the Homeland Security uh, Committee. This, what this has done now is it's tied in Homeland Security closer to my operations and to, to my ability to respond uh, quicker and more efficiently to the needs uh, that we have in the Homeland Security. So this is a movement that, uh, that we've just done. The support that we're getting now is, is uh, I think, much better, and I think, I think the plans are in place that uh, I, I think the, the support that we can anticipate uh, is coming. Uh, it hasn't, it's not completely there, but I think in the future we'll see more activity in there. Great. General Tuxel. One of the things that's, uh, Homeland Security goes across the gambit, as you well know, and uh, in our recovery from Hurricane Isabel, I can tell you that the uh, uh, Federal Emergency FEMA and that part of DHS just did a wonderful job of, uh, of mitigating and helping us. And for the first time, they did many things that we had not seen before to include soil mitigation. So they are doing everything they can to help. I agree with General Lowenberg. There are still many things, uh, many areas, and many uh, uh, procedures, policies that we do need to take a look at to see how they will affect and work with the National Guard. Because he is correct when he says there are many missions that are are what the Guard should be doing, and we should have the opportunity to have some funding from DHS. Well, let me follow up on that. Do you believe there's adequate coordination uh, between uh, DOD and DHS in preparation uh, for, the, for the protection of the homeland when it comes to the role of the National Guard? I would uh, uh, hesitate to answer that okay. for fear that I would uh, uh, I, I've got some ideas, but I think that's all they are, sir. All right. Now I'm intrigued. <laughs> General Lohenberg. I think there's excellent coordination underway. And as, as the two agencies mature, and I think we have to be mindful that both the Department of Homeland Security and the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Defense are, are new creations chartered by Congress. Uh, that they're getting their legs under them. And uh, as those processes mature, the dialogue becomes stronger and, and more directly results in positive effects in the states. Mm -hmm. Mr. In, in our states, the cooperation among the many agencies that we have to deal with in, when we have an emergency has matured. And this has matured over, over, over years and years and years. What I see right now is you have two new agencies that have, that have just been brought into, into being, and, and, and they're working extremely hard to reach this, 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 this great amount of cooperation that's going to be needed. Uh, I, I, see that, I see that growing every day uh, with great anticipation. I think, I think we'll, the maturity will be there where the, the cooperation will be what we expect. Would it be helpful if DOD and uh, DHS could uh, agree on a plan that would, in, uh, would involve the Guard uh, for Homeland Security and Defense? I think it would help immensely if both of the federal agencies with primary responsibility for homeland defense and security could develop a master concept of employment of the National Guard. And I'm quite confident as they do that, that the use of the National Guard in this broad spectrum of flexible response in Title 32 status, particularly if Congress unambiguously charters the National Guard to be used in Title 32, Title 32 status, will be key to the success of that strategy. Well, let me, I know my time is up, but uh, let me say I have a great appreciation for what the Guard does. Uh, Guard unit, the Red Horse unit in the district I represent uh, a little over two years ago, a uh, plane crashed and a, a large number were killed, and I know the impact it had, and I think that was my first realization of really what the Guard did and how important they were, and I'll never forget that. And uh, I may have been active duty for a career, but the Guard and the Reserves, I have a son who's a Reserve and a Chief of Staff who's a Reserve, so I get reminded of that all the time. <laughs> but I appreciate what everybody does and the role you, the role you all play, and I'm glad you came here today. And I, I really appreciate Ms. St. Lawrence. The report the GAO did was great because I think it really uh, made us understand what some of the problems are, what some of the issues are, and we here on this side of the room need to get this addressed and need to get it addressed pretty quickly. But thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, and I would just say as a parent, it's amazing what we learn from our children. Mm -hmm.
Uh, Mr. Ruppersberger. Sure. I'm going to get a little parochial here. I'm from the state of Maryland. I've worked with, with General Tuxel and General Bloom. I think I can be parochial when we have two generals both on the panels. So I'm glad you're both here today. Um, I know since my Maryland, Maryland 2nd Congressional District uh, is, has the Port of Baltimore, BWI Airport, a lot of, a lot of those different areas that, that are, uh, we're working with with respect to Homeland Security, um, we, I know a lot of what you're doing. My concern, though, is in the, uh, the, cap, the, the, the capital region. Uh, Maryland and Virginia have basically responsibility from a National Guard point of view for Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. does not have any National Guard. That's correct. No, and, sir, they do. They do. We, oh, they do. Okay. Yes, well, then sir. I, that's why I'm asking the question. Tell me what you feel needs to be done. What, how is the cooperation, uh, maybe with, with NORTHCOM or whatever, but, but as it relates to, to uh, National Guards both in Maryland and Virginia, um, and how it makes your job more difficult and what you need, you might recommend that we do to make it easier for national secu security? That, this is that hat. This is evolving, uh, and it's a very positive uh, uh, evo evolution. Uh, we have gotten the three uh, commanding general for the District of Washington and the two adjutants general, Maryland and Virginia, have sat down and forged out a letter of uh, or a memorandum of agreement on how we will actually work the EMAC and how we will come into each other's areas to make sure we take care of the national capital region. That right now is uh, it's being sought. We're seeking legal review through the Army, since the Army is the executive agent for the, uh, for the D.C. National Guard. Uh, that's where it's sitting right now. We hope once that's done, we'll be, uh, you know, we will start going down this further. The next thing that I think we should do is the Joint Task Force. We, we need to uh, be part of the Military District of Washington. And we've had a uh, uh, one meeting with the Military District of Washington, and that went very, very well, and we, can, we will continue to have meetings so that we start talking about how the Guard can be employed, how the Guard can be used, and how we will be probably helping the first responders because when 9-11 hit, the on-scene commander was from Virginia. He was a, uh, a first responder in a fire company. Uh, there was no federal involvement in that until well after. Uh, and the first people to guard the Pentagon was the 115th Military Police Battalion out of Parkville and Salisbury. And they were there the very next day at 11 o'clock with 136 soldiers. So the, we see right now that the, the Adjutant General and the Commanding General of the National Capital Region will be pivotal to putting together and helping assemble a plan that will, will make sure that the Guard is tasked appropriately. When we, when we talk, I'm going to change subject matter now. When we talk about about priorities, when we talk about transformation, when we when we talk about all the issues we've talked about today, in the end, it comes down to money and about the resources is, that have to go in order to implement the programs that you're talking about. Now, the there's a debate on how much the state should pay or the federal should pay. When it comes to homeland security and that role. Uh, I think it's important that, that the federal government stand behind the, the National Guard, especially with the states now having, having extremely difficult problems with respect to their budgets. The, the issue, and, and General Tuxel, you and I discussed this, we were talking about the, the, between, the issue between Title 32 and Title 10. And I think right now that, um, that the issue of that we should change, and I'm going to ask you, Mr. Uh, I mean, the, the uh, General Lohenberg, to, to address this, since General Tuxel said you were the expert. I'm not sure uh, whether you are or not, but, but he thinks he's setting are. me up, sir. Okay, setting you up. <laughs> it's the stars you have on the on the. Anyhow, the um, right now, the other than than uh, a, a couple issues such as drug uh, activities or. Um, basically, all that, that the Title 32 money can be used for, from, it's my understanding, is for training. And uh, if there are other areas, let me know. But what would you recommend that we do? I, mean, I know the governors would love to be able to, to uh, federally, to have the orders that, that you're under the federal mandate or whatever that order is, to be able to do some of the things that are being done in the state, which really could be considered homeland security. Uh, let's talk about what you would recommend what type of legislation or what type of mandate you would like to see? And secondly, um, how, how much would this be? Because whatever we talk about, what we're going to do, we have to talk about monies. 
Let me be very clear at the outset in stating that when the states or territories use the National Guard for a state purpose, they pay for 100% of all of the expenses of the utilization of those National Guard forces. There is no federal state match. And so the governors, as they ask for unambiguous authority to use the Guard in Title 32 status, are not asking for the federal government to pay for something for which the paramount interest lies in the state. There are a broad range of issues in the realm of homeland security, however, in which there are both state and federal interests, and in which when there is a paramount federal interest, it's in the national interest to use the National Guard, such as for airport security or border security or protecting DOD critical infrastructure or critical infrastructure for other federal agencies. And it's in that realm in which the governors and the Defense Science Board and the Adjutant General have urged Congress to unambiguously authorize use of the National Guard in Title 32 status for those homeland security and defense related areas in which there is a paramount federal interest and there's a federal interest in assuring that the mission is executed among the several states or the affected states in a consistent manner. And, and so whether that's done by federalizing the National Guard and creating a lot of additional expenses in doing so, or whether it's done in Title 32 status in which the service itself is paid for by the federal government, but we take full advantage of all of the existing command and control structure, so there are no added costs, that's really the question for Congress. Uh, one other issue, and then, then I'm, I'm finished, the, the issue of retention and recruitment. I, I asked that question of the general, and I'd like to hear from, from the panel where we are, wh what we need to do. Uh, the general mentioned the issue of, of, of medical insurance, th those type of issues for... Re recruiting sense. and retention uh, for the National Guard continues to be one of our challenges. One of the things that I have noticed uh, and I will let my, my fellow adjutants general talk, talk to this as well. But those units that we have used, that we have deployed, that we have, uh, have done our, uh, our noble legal, Iraqi freedom, enduring freedom, when they come back, they're very, very proud of their service. They're very proud they had the opportunity to be a part of the larger picture and the part of our global war on terror. And for the better part, these people that we, are, that we are deploying and bringing home want to stay. They don't want to get out. And we thought, and this is anecdotal information that I'm coming up with, but I'm watching these units. We just got our 115th Military Police Battalion back uh, from Iraq. They had been called up for number one, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Pentagon. They were then pulled off that, and they were sent to Fort Stewart for uh, uh, duty down there uh, under Noble Eagle. They came out and they were uh, told the next thing they were going to do was Guantanamo, Operation Enduring Freedom, and then they finally had the opportunity to go to Baghdad. Uh, so they, they've done all three. And surprisingly enough, that unit is enjoying retention that I didn't think I would see. Now, we are correct. Uh, it, it, when you sign up a soldier or an airman, you're signing up the spouse, and that we, we need to be very, very aware of that. But these young men and women are very happy with, with their service to this nation, and we should be very proud of them. But two, I think the, uh, the health care is an issue. TRICARE for, you know, for, for our members would be great. And those, those things uh, that gives in incentives for education and other incentives for our soldiers and airmen. Recruiting and retention in the state of Washington, as I believe in most states, is at historic highs, and it has been for the past four years, predating the attacks of 2001. What we don't know is the effects of these prolonged periods of mobilization and deployment overseas and what an impact that will have. To this date, for shorter duration deployments, retention has been the very highest among the units most frequently deployed. Uh, but again, we're, we're entering uh, an arena in which we have no national experience. I will say that the importance of medical and dental coverage, which many Guard men and women are unable to provide for themselves in their private capacity, is only collaterally a benefits issue. It is first and foremost a military readiness issue. A disturbingly high percentage of the Army National Guard soldiers mobilized and deployed and currently serving in Iraq were delayed and, and uh, 
there were obstacles to their assimilation into the just-in-time training because they needed medical and primarily dental attention. And some of them are still awaiting deployment because of correctable medical and dental conditions that would have been obviated if they had access to the federal TRICARE program. So medical and dental coverage is a military readiness issue, first and foremost. In Texas, we've had four years of record-setting recruiting. Uh, this year, we're approximately 19 percent of, uh, ahead of where we were last year in the, in the area of recruiting. So I don't see a problem. We've met all the National, Gu National Guard Bureau's goals for strength in, in, in the Army National Guard. The Air National Guard seems to be steady and, and holding tight. Uh, the retention uh, this year uh, we're about 2 percent lower in our losses than we, we have been in the last 10 years. So if that's an indication uh, that our retention is, 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 is holding well. Now, I will tell you, we have, we have had a test program uh, in the state of Texas where I have put dedicated retention managers in every, every Army battalion. And I think this, is, this may be a reason why our, our retention is, is going up and our, our losses are going down. Uh, at least I hope that's, that's the indication. But at this particular time, I don't think there's any panic button, button to push as far as the retaining. Our, our men and women are very dedicated and, and uh, they are very loyal and very pleased to be serving a worthwhile mission at this particular time. So, uh, and, and the amount of volunteers we have that would, that would volunteer for a second tour. Uh, is amazing. So I, I think if, uh, if we do some right things, if, if, we, if we take care of some incentives, if we take care of the families of these deployed individuals uh, and, and, we, and we work with the employers, I think this is going to help in the retention arena. Thank you all very much. Oh, you GAO's perspective would be that this is an issue that definitely needs to be carefully watched over the next few years. It is probably a little too soon, and um, some of the initiatives that General Blum has underway that could bring more predictability to the force and establish rotation cycles would probably be very helpful. I think there is a question of how soon uh, we can get the Guard to that level where they are on a more predictable schedule that's based out over like one every six years. And then also, I think the issue has to be watched from a skills perspective. As our testimony states, 92 percent of MPs have been deployed and 18 percent more than once. So there are certain skills that need to be looked uh, at. The cha chairman wants to move on. One suggestion I want to throw out is, is the retirees. We've gotten calls in our office about retirees that would like to be involved somehow and a plan that could use retirees for a certain desk work or whatever. I'm just throwing that out as a suggestion. No, if, the gym, if the gentleman wants to pursue that, I'd be happy to. Uh, is it, well, it's, yeah. I don't, I got, I'm putting it out to evaluate it. Maybe, Chairman Blum, you're, here, you're still here. Uh, the, the retirees, and, and we've seen that in other parts of government, people who are well-trained, well-qualified, and, and yet they're retired, and they might be able to, to do something or have the expertise that could take the burden off of, of some of our duties. Mr. Tux, General Tux, do you want to respond to that? If I could, uh, thank you. Mr. Chair, uh, what we have in the, uh, in the state of Maryland, and I can only speak for the state of Maryland, is we call the Maryland Defense Force. It is a force of professionals. Uh, those professionals are doctors, lawyers, uh, uh, health care providers, uh, crisis uh, response uh, uh, personnel, uh, chaplains, etc. And what we try to do here is we try to use both the lawyers and the, and the, uh, uh, the, the medical end of the house to do what we can for our deploying soldiers to make sure that they've got a good will, to make sure that they've got, uh, uh, the, uh, they're getting a good, some good health care. But also what we're doing is using that in emergency management as, uh, as, a, re as a response force. So yes, sir, and we're also looking in, in the cyber world for, those, for that same retired group uh, to take a look at cyber terrorism and what we could do with that defense force. And just make sure that it's beyond the age of 72 because a lot of the calls we're getting are over the age of 70. <laughs> I thank the gentleman. Uh, this is a very important hearing and it is, I think, somewhat scratching the surface. I mean, there's so many questions we could ask, but I find myself writing the question, does the National Guard have an impossible task? And then I'm thinking, because they have to do two things. They've got to fight a war, be prepared to fight a war, and fight a war. 
and then they've got to protect their homeland. And I realize there's some synergy between the two, but there are clearly some differences. So then I think, and I know that our National Guard are components to a full force structure. So then I think, well, maybe it's, you know, they, they have the role of MPs so they don't have to take the hill, where our active forces may in fact have to take the hill and it's a different kind of training that you want constantly to have. I'm hearing our GAO say some things that you all didn't really, in my judgment, respond to. You made very important points, but didn't respond to. And I, I, I want to say that I, I, I want to, I want to get a response to the idea that we say our retention is up. Excuse me, our retention is stable. Uh, we are getting new and en you know enlistees, and yet we don't have the full force structure within the National Guard, so that unit has to take from another unit. And that bothers me because they haven't been working with each other. And, and I know for a fact that the equipment they have is hand-me-down. It may not be bad, but it's hand-me-down. Clearly, with our, they don't get the new airplanes. They don't get the new vehicles. They get the hand-me-downs, in my judgment. So um, would you first, um, uh, Ms. St. Laurent, tell me the first, second, and third point you want to make, and I want each of our generals to respond. In terms of uh, your major points, I want you to right. summarize your major points. One is I would you, say yeah. near-term readiness is an issue uh, that needs to be looked at very carefully. That's and, one right. We would like to see a plan to address that. Um, on the homeland security issue, I oh, think those yeah. requirements need to be defined better. And once they're defined, there's still a lot of analysis that needs to be done of. Um, how that's going to be operationalized, what kinds of training, what kinds of equipment are going to be needed. I don't think we're there yet on that one. This is Homeland Security. Right. Let me just put in uh, for uh, our three generals here. We were briefed that the DOD has not fully defined requirements, readiness standards, and readiness measures for Homeland Defense and security missions that will lead or support. So guard preparedness for Homeland Defense and security missions is unmeasured and unknown. That's what we've been told. Now, you also made another point that they are uh, not fully staffed, correct? Right. And that they then have to what? The full-time, that they have to transfer personnel and equipment. But um, the one other issue is the full-time manning of Army Guard units. Although most guard, guardsmen are part-timers, uh, each unit does have some full-time personnel, and the Army Guard only has about 15 percent, whereas the Air Guard has about 33 percent. The Army Guard has a plan to increase that, but even by 2012, they're only going to be at about 71 percent of their requirements. Those people are critical to keeping the units running, planning the training, tracking training, tracking medical okay. readiness, and those are important. This first take, just the readiness issue. An honest assessment. Yeah. For the last 10 years, I chaired the Readiness Committee in the state of Texas. And when I first got there in 93, out of uh, 58 reporting entities, 54 of them met the readiness standards. As we decreased the full-time manning, the readiness of those units decreased. Also, the fact that the structures of, of we have, that we have in the National Guard today do not meet the needs that we that we have in today's army. The majority of the, the forces in, in Texas are armored from, from an armored division. Of all the men and women that we have deployed out of Texas, not one tank has been deployed, not one Bradley has been deployed. We've taken people out of out of the tanks and 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 made them infantrymen or or gave them the M1s and and uh, and had them guarding uh, places throughout the United States. They have not been used in their in, in their capacities as armored crewmen. Right. So that does affect the readiness of the organization. The fact that we have been manned at, at, uh, at C3 level and below, uh, is, there's no way in the world that we can, we can bring that unit up to 100% of its authorized strength without going to other units. And the minute we do that, we automatically break the other units. So the answer to that is once we go through this trans, trans, that transformation and we get the right type of formations that we can man at 90 to 100 percent, I think that's going to take care of some of this readiness issue. 
Resourcing is going to be the problem. In the state of Texas, the full-time manning, we're about 40 percent of what we're authorized in our full-time manning. That has a direct impact upon the readiness of our organization. Is that a cost issue or, 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 or a volunteer issue? This, this, is, this is the full-time... No, is it a matter of cost or is it a matter that you don't have the people no, willing it's, to... No, it's a matter of funding. Okay. Sure. Thank you. General Lomberg. Readiness for both homeland defense and homeland security, for both overseas missions and domestic missions, is a function of articulating the requirements and funding to meet those requirements. Uh, Full-time manning, as has been previously noted, is the number one weakness of the Army National Guard. It's the number one failure of the Department of Defense and the Department of Army. And as you've noted, Mr. Chairman, equipping the National Guard with frontline equipment as part of the full fielding plan for, in particular, the Army is something that is handicapping our level of readiness for both combat and domestic uh, security missions. As has been noted, and you are correct, the requirements for employment of the National Guard for homeland security purpose have not yet been articulated by Northern Command or by the Department of Defense. When that happens, we're going to need to be resourced, particularly in the Army National Guard, to meet those homeland security needs. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we are a Cold War construct still. And if you take a look, we have been funded, and I will you know, mimic what, uh, what my uh, fellow Adjutant General said, we're funded at C3. Can't expect it, and that's minimum mission ready. That's minimum. Uh, so we end up cross-leveling. We, we bring uh, equipment in. We bring other uh, troops in. One of the reasons is that if you have, let's say, a normal, uh, an infantry battalion, you will have X number that you're sending to basic uh, uh, infantry school. You'll have X number that are going through basic training. You'll have X number in schools. And you'll have so many that you will not be able to tap for one reason or the other, maybe sickness. That means while you're funded at 82% or so, you've got X number of people that, are no that you cannot reach out and take. So you have to reach over and take them from another unit so that you've already got a built-in structural deficiency for how many people you actually have in that battalion. You're authorized this many, but you only really realize a much lower number. Now, General Blum right now is, is addressing that situation so that we can start having uh, a school account, or if you would, uh, a holding account that does not count against the readiness. The Army has it, the Air Force has it, but uh, the guard in the Army side of the house has not had it. Uh, as far as uh, uh, clearly defined homeland security requirements, we do not have those yet. We are right now making them up as we go for our various states as far as critical infrastructure, what we should be doing there. Uh, one of the things that was very interesting to me were the amount of critical infrastructure uh, plans that are out there and connoting or denoting what critical infrastructure is around. And in the National Capital Region, everyone's got a dog in the fight. So I think that need, we, need to, we need to ferret through that and come up with the requirements as to what we really should do. And the challenge we have, to, we have is that we have to do it while we're in the midst of a very real war. And that um, makes this an extraordinarily difficult undertaking. Let me uh, have you, Ms. St. Laurent, respond to what you heard. Were, were you, it sounds to me like you all are pretty much in agreement. Is that your sense? I think that's very true. I think uh, there is a consistent theme. Uh, in doing our work, we saw a very consistent pattern in going to all the states that we visited, Georgia, Texas, Oregon, and New Jersey. Um, they all had a wide variety of state missions and critical infrastructure protection missions that they were dealing with. At the same time, they were getting ready to deploy units overseas. And so I agree with the comments that have been made. Well, I would say to General Bloom and General Love, we know as well that this is a challenge for Congress uh, to step up and make sure that we are beginning to address this. And I think our committee will um, develop a very honest report about what uh, Congress needs to do, what the administration needs to do, what defense needs to do, and, and hopefully uh, how we get there. I'm going to ask the professional staff to ask a question or two, and then we're going to uh, call it quits. Thank you, Mr. Shays. I have a two-part question just for our adjutants general. 
um, talking about readiness. Since there is no um, federal or national readiness standards for homeland defense and security missions performed by the Guard, how do you judge or certify the readiness of the Guardsmen for your governor in these roles? And how might the federal government begin to judge that readiness for homeland defense missions? Well, in the state of Washington, we certify, to use that term, I, I attest to the governor as to our readiness for the Homeland Security Mission by looking at the Homeland Security Strategic Plan that has been developed solely in coordination with the Department of Homeland Security. That's not to say that that same level of readiness or that the same requirements would necessarily be articulated by Northern Command. As best I try to divine what those requirements are, um, they may have a different perspective based upon classified information that they have available to them that uh, has not been shared with me, notwithstanding my security clearance. I think it's important that, that, that we look at the fact that we train for our wartime mission. For our, at, at this particular time, our, our, our training focuses on the, on the war on terrorism. This brings our soldiers and airmen up to a, 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 a readiness level. There are skills that we train to that are transferable that when we go into the homeland security mode. And we've done this for years and years. So uh, when we, when, even though the, the requirements are not defined by homeland security or Northern Command, we still have to maintain our wartime skills within our organizations and our formations. And again, like I said, they do transfer to the skills that we do need when we perform either state active duty or homeland security missions. I agree. The uh, uh, really the the byproduct or the or the benefit to Homeland Security is the training that we do for that federal mission. Be it uh, and we have many disciplines and many skill sets, and they are readily, as as General Marty said, transferable to the public sector. And uh, when you take a look at and certify a full up military police unit, you know that they're ready to do the job because many of those in there are uh, are. Uh, Local police that are that are in that you know that that are already going to work in that area. They're just putting on a different uniform. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Shays. Thank you. I, I'd like to know: Is there anything that you basically prepared for that we didn't ask that you think we should have asked, and or you thought we shouldn't ask, but you know you need to answer uh, <laughs> either one. Uh, in other words, is there a question I should have asked that we didn't that you need to answer? Is there anything you want to put on the record before we uh, adjourn this hearing? I think we're all set then? Is that yes, right? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I think yeah. I speak for the adjutants general in thanking you for your generosity in extending the time and for the particular interest you and other members of the committee have shown in these subjects. So I recognize that there are a lot of questions that could be asked and a lot of answers that uh, perhaps were left unspoken. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm confident and very grateful for the interest of this committee. Thank you. Well, we will be getting to all those questions, and there will be uh, some of the informal dialogue that occurs between uh, all of you and our staff uh, is, is very helpful in ultimately helping us make our recommendations. So I thank you all for your service to your country. Um, again, I want to thank uh, General Blum and General Love for their uh, uh, participation by listening to what all of you had to say and I'm going to adjourn this hearing and hopefully get a 2.30 flight. Thank you.
Next, President Bush's comments following his appearance before the September 11th Commission. After that, the State Department releases its annual World Terrorism Report. 